It's Thursday, June 2nd in New York City, and this is Yahoo Finance Live. I'm Brian Sazi with Brad Smith. Julie Hyman is on assignment this week, but I know she's still watching us on our free mobile app. Let's take a quick look at the futures here right now. You're seeing futures, I would say, weaken off the highs of the session in large part because of disappointing ADP jobs uh, numbers that came out moments ago. Uh, of course, that sets up, interestingly, for the jobs report tomorrow, Brad. Yeah, 128,000 private payrolls added during the month of May. We're going to dive further into that in a moment. Taking a look at the futures here right now that are still holding on to some of those gains, those gains that we were seeing also reflected of what we're seeing in the oil market right now. As we see any type of drawback there, you'll start to see that reflected in some of the equities as well. And that's exactly what we're tracking here right now. WTI down by about eight-tenths of a percent. You're also seeing Brent crude down eight-tenths of a percent. And then and additionally, our Bob gasoline futures, you're seeing that lower by a little more than half a percent right now. And of course, OPEC meeting is underway. Also watching yields uh, as well. Yield, yields are climbing, tenure yields, I should say, close to 3% uh, here. Really, I would say after those Jamie Dimon bearish comments yesterday at a conference that still has Wall Street in a tizzy. Now, here are three things you need to know right now. Sheryl Sandberg is stepping down from her role as chief operating officer at Facebook's parent company, Meta leaving behind a 14-year legacy at the tech titan. Javier Olivan, who is currently the chief growth officer, will take over for Sandberg this fall. Yahoo Finance tech editor Dan Halley joins us with some key analysis. And Dan, there's a lot to, as they would say, unpack here. From a, a meta standpoint, uh, they have just lost a very key leader at the company, then, of course, a key leader throughout corporate America. Yeah, I mean, obviously, her impact on meta, Facebook, let's, I don't know what we'll call it, uh, they, uh, you know, it's been uh, invaluable, right? She helped grow this company uh, from uh, essentially when it was still a startup to this gigantic behemoth of a social networking empire, right? So she was part of the uh, ability for that company to grow out its ad platform to become the company that it is. Now, that also does leave behind this legacy of various issues that have come to light uh, over the years when it comes to their data collection capabilities, uh, their ability to police what kind of uh, ads are purchased, how ads are purchased, obviously the 2016 election, uh, when we had uh, disinformation campaigns, Russian uh, agents purchasing ads on Facebook uh, at the time. So she really does have this, you know, the, the, this complicated legacy of being the person that brought up this company alongside Mark Zuckerberg, but also, you know, left it with these stains as well. Yeah, and she recognized that in the post, also recognizing that Facebook right now is far different from what they had set out on years ago and the debate around social media changing beyond recognition since those early days. You know, all that considered, how does this position Facebook in what they want to be doing to diversify their revenue streams going forward? Yeah, I think this really is kind of a, a almost way of them saying that we're going whole hog, you know, as far as the metaverse goes, right? Uh, we had Cheryl there guiding us through building out the ad platforms, ensuring that we're able to grow uh, alongside uh, the purchase with WhatsApp, the purchase of uh, Instagram, building out Messenger on its own, selling ads across those, monetizing as best as possible. Now they're kind of transitioning to this new version of Meta. Uh, they're going to obviously be changing uh, the ticker symbol soon. Mm -hmm. That will kind of be its final movement over to that Meta side of things. And I think that's where, you know, Cheryl Sandberg kind of doesn't fit into this puzzle anymore, right? So they're going to bring in Javier Olivan. And even though uh, he's filling in the COO position, uh, Zuckerberg had said it's not going to be the same as what Sheryl Sandberg had been for the company then. What I'd be concerned, you're seeing uh, Facebook shares, of course, uh, they are the top ticker on the Yahoo Finance platform right now, higher slightly in the pre-market. You do have to worry about what other defections there could be uh, from Sandberg's team. When you lose a leader like that, usually there are a whole wave of people that exit stage left as well. But Dan and, and, and Brad, another issue here is Sheryl Sandberg uh, has had a side business, if you will, with Lean In. You know, she has championed female leadership in the C-suite for many, many, many years. I'm interested in who takes over that baton uh, because there are not a lot of other female leaders in the C-suite right now, first and foremost, and secondarily, not a lot of them with the platform of Sandberg. And then last but not least, not a lot of them that want to even talk out on these issues. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting, right? Because she was that leader for, for so long, especially when she was so public as a leader at Facebook. Mm -hmm. But she slowly started to kind of pull back 
from that position, right? At one point, you know, I mean, she was at the congressional hearings uh, on the uh, in 2018, right. dealing with the 2016 uh, election interference. She was the face of Facebook uh, at that point, you know, more so than Zuckerberg was. Uh, and so she was that that big presence. But she's been pulling back a lot in recent years. We haven't really seen her uh, doing much publicity uh, for the company. If she has, it's been very minor. It hasn't been, uh, you know, putting out fires or anything along those lines. So, you know, I, it's, to your point, you know, it's almost as though she hasn't been that person in that role uh, as, you know, this huge presence uh, as a female C-suite leader uh, for some time. We're going to be continuing this conversation, but a huge presence indeed in the C-suite, but especially in Silicon Valley that needs more gender parity, gender representation. Uh, and she certainly was that for such a long period of time. It'll be interesting to see what comes next and not just for Sandberg, but also for meta platforms mm -hmm. as well here. Dan, thanks for joining us this morning. Also, everyone, we've got to keep a tab on shares of GME. They are lower here this morning, down by about 1.5% in pre-market trading. The company reported first quarter earnings, which revealed a wider than expected net loss of over $2 a share. The company once again failed to provide an outlook for the rest of the year, but did follow up its recent NFT wallet unveiling with the announcement of an NFT marketplace, which is set to launch in Q2 for the gaming retailer, <laughs> I might add. Brad, uh, this is, now let's start with the earnings call, because yeah. I put this out this morning. This yeah. is a joke. This whole GameStop story is turning into a big, fat joke. I don't know what CEO Matt Furlong uh, is doing at this company. This was his shortest earnings call as CEO of GameStop. Seven minutes 41 seconds. And the call before this wasn't exactly great. It was a 10 minutes and five seconds or something like that. Zero details on what they plan to do. And I know this is what they're trying to do over at GameStop. Just they don't want to lay out their master plan on how they're going to change the universe and send their stock price maybe up to $700 a share. But at some point, as an executive of a public company, you have to come out here and say, this is what we're going to do. These are our numbers. Here's how we're going to execute. Take some questions from the Wall Street community. Try to get more analysts out there covering the stock. This is another embarrassing performance by a guy, Brad, that made $17 million last year despite only being six months on the job. What are you doing all day? Well, it also begs the question of when we think about the Wall Street community or the community of investors here, when you have that low analyst coverage mm -hmm. and it's really more the retail investor out there that is so focused on GameStop, do the fundamentals matter? I would still argue, yes, the fundamentals do matter if you're looking at this company and the vision and how they're using the money, even taking into account some of the at-the-market equity offerings, which, quite frankly, if you are an investor, you should care about because that dilutes the shares that you have. And so with all that considered, how they're using that money when they went out to the markets and introduced those offerings in 2021, now in 2022, focusing on the NFT landscape, which we know has hit a headwind, a major hurdle in the road here as valuations for many of those non-fungible tokens have decreased substantially from the fanfare that we had seen even in 2021. At this point in time, I wonder when that starts to actually drive revenue for them and produce a profit at the end of the day. <laughs> good, good luck with that. Uh, at least they teased. At least they told us they're coming out yeah. with an NFT marketplace in the second quarter. No projections, no anything else of what this might even look like. They just dropped it in their seven minute and 41 second earnings call. And, and I think if you are a believer, this ongoing believer in a GameStop on the Reddit threads, at some point you have to question why you in fact invested in a company that still operates thousands of stores, terrible locations, really bad lease rates, and you're getting no strategy from uh, an executive team, a well-paid executive team with many years of experience at Amazon. You're putting your life savings in this company and you're getting nothing from management, just another quarter of operating losses. I mean, <laughs> at the end of the day, it's really just I know I'm hot. I know I'm hot on GameStop, but, but, but it really but bothers me. It bothers a, it, me. It's, a, it's such a moment. It has been such a momentum trade where it's really just going against the shorts. And so with the short interest that's pulled back tremendously, is there still that same fanfare that dives head in to GameStop? Oh, there is. I, I'm going to go look at my Twitter feed, and I, I can guarantee I'm just getting absolutely shredded. And I'm sorry, I'm going to bring you into it, too, as well. <laughs> yeah, okay. I mean, welcome to the cesspool with me. Cool. All right, switching gears. And we got the ADP report, JAWS report this morning, ahead of tomorrow's big payrolls report. Private payroll employment rose by just 128,000, falling far from the estimated 300,000, uh, marking the slowest growth in the post-pandemic era recovery. And Brad, what, thing, what really stood out to me in this report and is a major red flag as I draw my notepads, I take a square and I make <laughs> it in red and then I put a little check mark next to it. 
small employers, uh, small jobs yeah. uh, lost 91,000, small uh, or small time jobs, small businesses, I should say, lost 91,000 jobs. And that tells me these are companies very much struggling with inflation and finding the talent they need in this environment. You know, this is a, a tick down month over month from what we've seen from the private payrolls numbers and particularly here. And we've got that kind of uh, amazing work by our team putting together kind of this longer term view of exactly where those ads have come, putting this in the context as well of all the jobs data and the employment situation that we're getting this week. It, of course, precedes the jobs data that we're going to get tomorrow, the jobs report from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And all of this considered, what we had seen in the past is that the two might not marry up the same that we would have expected, where you could get a blowout on ADP, but perhaps a lag or a miss on the expectation in the monthly jobs report. Jolts, we saw that tick down mm -hmm. yesterday slightly, but still hovering in the range of some of those record highs. So all of that considered, look still across some of those key categories in leisure and hospitality that had gotten hit the hardest on the onset of the pandemic, retail as we continue to track where those jobs are coming back. But at the end of the day, it's also still going to come down to wages and how much new employees are getting paid or able to negotiate in this job environment and this market, which we know is already cutting in to so many of the margins for businesses, too. Right on. And you know what else is bothering me here, too? Let's say we do get a sub-100,000 print on non-farm payrolls tomorrow, which is possible. The president, I think, teed that up in his op-ed here a couple of days ago. And, of course, the ADP report, ADP report does nothing to help that. Now you will have concerns about a recession. That will fuel that recession narrative on Wall Street and with uh, others in the business community. At the same time, the Fed is still going to be out there raising rates by 50 basis points probably at, at its next few meetings. That is a terrible setup for this market. Yeah, we're going to be keeping a close eye on all of this economic data. Sticking with the conversation, let's welcome in our first guest to break down how this will impact the markets. Joining us now, we've got Quincy Crosby, who is the LPL Financial Chief Equity Strategist. Quincy, great to have you here with us this morning. Uh, first and foremost, I want to get your reaction to a bunch of the employment situation data that we've seen come out to the course of this week and, of course, leading up to tomorrow's jobs report as well. You know, it's interesting because what we're seeing, just a, a, a change, a, a, a change. We don't know if this is now a trajectory or just a one-off. But if you looked at the conference board, for example, jobs hard to get, you're starting to see a little bit of, of, of a shift there. Uh, then you also saw in the ISM, Institute for Supply Management Manufacturing Report, take a look at the jobs uh, aspect, employment. That was down a bit. Uh, tomorrow, we also get the Institute for Supply Management Service Sector, which, of course, is the largest. I mean, we're a service sector economy. It's going to be interesting to see what the employment numbers look like in that report. The question is, does the Fed like this? Because what the Fed needs is to get those wages down, get the negotiating uh, capability to get higher wages, to get that down. Because that, of course, will help bring down that price uh, wage spiral, which is which has taken hold. Companies, small, large, and medium, have got to pass that higher price of labor onto the consumer. That's inflation. Quincy, isn't this a, a terrible market backdrop? We're seeing decelerating job growth. Saw it here again in this ADP report. Now we're looking at several more rounds of rate increases. What case is there to be optimistic about stocks here? Well, yeah, at some point, the Fed finishes, right? The question is, does the Fed break anything along the way? They have actually come, they've come out. They've talked about pain, pain. You know, they use that word. You got to take them seriously on that. And you know, because they have started to talk about the need to get the number of jobs down, uh, it, because the more you take away the number of jobs, the supply uh, of jobs gives the uh, labor going in there get more uh, of a chance to get higher wages. Take that supply down and you cut the ability to get higher wages. So you heard Christopher Waller give this speech in um, in Germany just uh, a few days ago, and he mentioned, you know, what has to be done with the job market. Look, it's not a science. That's the issue. Uh, you, it's fine tuning and it's very difficult for the Fed that really just has blunt instruments to fine tune. Quincy, you mentioned that the wage pass on is a major part of the inflation scenario, but another part is the supply chain scenario as well. And so with that in mind, would you be leaning your equity strategy more towards companies who are able to mitigate some of the headwinds on the wage front or on the supply chain front right now? 
Well, obviously, it would be good to, to get both. But one of the yeah. things that we're seeing is uh, we expect uh, the supply chain to ease even at the margin. That's what we're looking for, that these headwinds ease at the margin because the expectations is they'll ease more. So you just give the example of China. You open up Shanghai. It's going to take time before people go back to work, go to the factory. Shanghai is what? Uh, 25 million people. It's 7 percent of the Chinese $17.5 trillion economy, but it's one of the most important. So you expect to see the port there, which is one of the most important global supply uh, uh, hubs uh, for the world, for for, uh, the supply chain. That should start to ease as well. And then the factories beginning to work should ease. So that's important, but I have to say, you listen to companies and they talk about inflation, but they talk about the wages too. We're seeing freezing, right? Hiring freezes. We're also hearing the chatter uh, amongst companies of a whisper of companies saying, hey, let's, let's be a lot more careful with hiring. You know, they don't want to come out and say we're freezing, but you know that they're moving in that direction when you're, when you're much more careful. That actually should start to um, tamp down the, um, the higher wages and the ability to get higher wages. All right. Being, yeah, being strategic in their hiring plans is what we've heard as well from some of those companies. Quincy yeah. Crosby, who is the LPL financial chief equity strategist. Thanks for the time this morning. We appreciate it. You guys, coming up, shares of Hewlett Packard Enterprise are sliding in the pre-market after a disappointing Q2 earnings report. We're joined by the HPE CFO on the other side of this short break to discuss the challenges the company's facing. Shares of Hewlett Packard Enterprises are under pressure after the company missed analyst estimates for sales and profits. The company also cut its full year profit forecast, citing its exit from Russia and supply chain, supply chain constraints as headwinds. Joining us for more is HPE's uh, CFO, Tarek Robiati. Tarek, good to see you here this morning. So, you had your fourth straight quarter of 20% plus order growth. That is good. But I think one of the biggest questions on the street here this morning is why isn't some of that growth? 
reaching the bottom line? Good morning, and thanks for having me on your channel today. It's a great question, and it's a great way to start our conversation. Yes, we've had four consecutive quarters of order growth of 20%, and it's remarkable, and it's across our entire portfolio of uh, products and services. The delta that exists between uh, order growth and revenue growth is driven by the supply shortages and also disruptions in the supply environment. So we have been witnessing this for some time. The supply chain globally across our industry is still not stable. It will take us a little bit of time to get to that point. And the reason why I say this is that you, we have to understand the root causes that got us to, to where we are in the industry. And we have to look back at how much uh, dependence there was on a, a supply chain that was based in Asia and in China in particular, and the fact that the supply chain is decoupling uh, from Asia and from China. That obviously takes time. We have been uh, coming from decades where 40% of the global manufacturing capacity was in China. And that will have to find a new equilibrium and be a lot more distributed across various countries in the globe, in Europe, and also in Asia. By the way, we've opened up a new factory in the Czech Republic to make sure that our supply chain is geared for the future and built to be not only efficient cost-wise, but also efficient in terms of speed, in terms of redundancy and resiliency uh, for the future. We're, so we're moving forward on that front, but obviously we cannot expect decades to be reversed in a quarter or two. It will take us I would say a few quarters to navigate this, and we're in, in the process of doing so, and so is the entire industry. What, what is that timeline that we should anticipate, that we should kind of benchmark against for the supply chain st to stabilize as correlated with the forecasts that you have? So we don't expect the supply chain uh, stability to be attained uh, before a few quarters from now. It will be well into next uh, calendar year, 2023. Um, part of the reason why that is, and we've witnessed this with the Shanghai uh, lockdowns, is that the pandemic is not over and uh, China is uh, continuing to enforce its zero COVID policy. And obviously, uh, this uh, from time to time creates some disruptions like the one we've seen in Shanghai. So my best estimate for you is to say at this stage, we're seeing this um, stabilization happening towards the end of uh, uh, calendar year 23. Tarek, within your revised guidance, how much of a, an economic slowdown have you baked in? Yes, so our revised guidance was um, change on EPS, but I have to say we maintain our free cash flow guidance of $1.8 to $2 billion. And that's very, very important, particularly now with the downturn of the equity markets. Um, companies are no longer simply valued on revenue multiples, but we have to look at profitability and free cash flow generation. And we are doing extremely well on that side. We're comfortable at this stage reiterating our guidance on free cash flow of $1.8 to $2 billion. In that guidance, we obviously had to factor in some changes at the macroeconomic level, as you point out. And one of the headwinds that we're facing is uh, foreign exchange rates. The US dollar is appreciating materially uh, against other currencies. If you look in particular, the euro, the British pound, and the yen, and when we started our fiscal year, we had anticipated some movement in favor of the US dollar. We anticipated that this would affect our growth by 50 basis points downwards. But the reality now is that this is going to affect our growth by two points uh, downwards. And so that is one of the headwinds that we're facing because effectively Europe is suffering uh, given all the events that are uh, happening there. And it's normal that you therefore see uh, an impact on us. 40% uh, of our revenue comes from the Americas, 27% um, comes from Asia Pacific, and the remainder comes from Europe, which is a large number, 39%, if you consider it um, from our vantage point. Okay, and so considering where that revenue gets made up internationally and the different regions that you operate within, the, the exit from Russia particularly, where in the rest of the business do you expect for some of that free cash flow to be able to be put back to work in order to make sure that you're kind of offsetting any of the losses that you would have seen in Russia going forward? So Russia, in terms of economic impact on us, was minimal. Uh, we did say in our earnings release that uh, we, um, uh, in the course of the quarter, were impacted in the amount of $250 million on revenue, uh, one point of total margins, and six cents of EPS. 
Of that $250 million impact, Russia was minimal. The rest was really more related to disruptions in the supply chain in, in China. Now, in our guidance and where we see the cash flow coming, it's, uh, we believe it's for us, it's a story of two components. One is the reversal of headwinds we had on the working capital level as we were buffering inventories for several quarters in a row. And two is also our own uh, historic restructuring plans are coming to an end. And those restructuring costs are diminishing very, very rapidly in our uh, free cash flow statement. So if you take the combination of growth in earnings, the reduction of working capital headwinds, and also the reduction of restructuring costs, we feel very comfortable that we can attain our free cash flow guidance for the full year. All right, we'll leave it there. Hewlett Packard Enterprises CFO Tarek Robiati, always good to see you. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you very much. All right, still to come, chew on this. Chewy tells naysayers to go fetch. After a surprising first quarter earnings beat, we have your early morning movers as well as the opening bell next. Welcome back to Yahoo Finance Live. Shares of Microsoft are under pressure in the pre-market after the company updated its full-year guidance. And Brad, wow, uh, especially a day after where we got some upbeat guidance from, from Salesforce, Salesforce, which is, of course, is a Microsoft competitor. I would say, just looking at this presentation that Microsoft put together uh, via a new filing, they, they lowered the bottom end of their earnings outlook by $0.04, cents, and they trimmed the top end of their earnings outlook by $0.03. Cents. And they're blaming FX exchanges, which is not too different uh, from what we just heard from HPE CFO uh, Tarek Robiati moments ago, uh, another tech company lowering their outlook because of FX headwinds. Yeah, this is for their fiscal fourth quarter. So in this year, particularly here through May, what they're seeing right now is revenue. The guidance range previously was for $52.4 billion to $53.2 billion. Right now, they're lowering that to a range of $51.9 billion, or if you round up, 52. But the high end, that's going to come in at around 52.74 bill. So when we think about this in the net income perspective, yeah, you broke down exactly what they're looking for. Uh, on the net income side, that would be closer to 16.85 and then top end 17.43. And I think 
for more what we're seeing on Microsoft. This is impacting the Nasdaq composite. This is impacting more broadly this move that we're seeing in the pre-market for some of the major averages moving lower right now. Yeah, now you would have to think as more companies present at various investment banks in the coming weeks, you will see more guide downs because of FX, various economic pressures. But again, uh, we are watching that opening bell on Wall Street after that Microsoft warning. And here's that opening bell kick off today's trading session. And there we have that opening bell on Wall Street, sponsored, of course, by our friends at Flex Shares. Uh, and again, lots of focus uh, on, on Microsoft here, of course, that Dow component warning, warning about their profits in their sales owing to FX headwinds. But we did have some other uh, companies and movers to watch here, Brad. We're watching Chewy. Uh, in the pre-market, shares were up about 16% here. Uh, that is after the company posted better than expected Results and coming into the session, a good uh, shout out, a good note from the folks over at Citigroup uh, that the short position in Chewy was about 25% of the flow coming into this wow. report. Uh, so the shorts really be betting against another disappointing quarter from Chewy. They didn't necessarily get it, but I would argue this was not a clean quarter from the company. You had gross profit margin pressure. You had a miss on their auto ship customers, a little over 20 million, I believe. The street was looking for something a little stronger. So not a clean quarter from Chewy, but, but perhaps just a little bit of a relief rally. Yeah, the gross margin actually declined uh, about 10 basis points a year over year, the company had noted. Uh, and then additionally, you look at the net margin, that declined as well by about 100 basis points year over year. You know, all these things considered, do the pandemic pet owners or the pandemic pet purchases or those furry friends that you allowed into your home, does that equate into future growth and consistent future growth and upselling from the Chewy side? Where can they continue to, as we had seen on the Petco front as well, a company that is very familiar with Chili, or not Chili's, Chewy. <laughs> um, I'm that was the name of my former dog. No, not really. <laughs> I'm, I'm just putting a restaurant business inside the Chewtopia, if you will. <laughs> but at the end of the day, it really does come back to where they can see some of the overlaps in services and products. We had seen more of these pet retailers leaning into insurance, other services that could become more sticky in creating this ecosystem here for them particularly. But I think from what we heard from the company and chief executive officer of Chewy, Samit Singh, saying that the fiscal year is off to a good start, 14% top line growth, sequential improvements in gross margin and profitability. Um, but at the end of the day, that's a sequential year over year. That's what we really want to take a closer look at here at the end of the day as well to really get a sense of how much they're able to keep those customers in their overall ecosystem on a year in, year out basis. Yeah, worth noting, right. Uh, and you're worth noting here, you saw Chewy shares up about 15% in the pre-market scene. Some of those gains weakened here uh, a couple minutes into the session. Perhaps as investors really drill down to this, uh, into this quarter, you have Citigroup re reiterating a, uh, a bearish rating uh, on Chewy. But I, I will note this too, I did not like to hear on the conference call from Subit Singh, uh, lower pet adoptions. You know, mm. We're seeing lower pet adoptions, uh, and it was pet adoptions that drove this company's financial results, results during the pandemic. But by and large, inter interesting quarter from Chewy, and I joked about on Twitter, Brad, I, I love sharing everything with our viewers. Every time I see this company's report, mm. I think about all my dogs that have died through the years. How depressing. What kind of dogs did and there's my, uh, there's my, And there's my tweet. Uh, my team yeah. just put it up for me. You know, that's just, you know, they do things every day that always surprised me to the upside. That is great work right there. And you know, it's depressing. That's why I don't have a dog right now. These things really traumatize me. What, what kind of dog did you have growing up? Uh, I had a Cocker Spaniel, one point Chips. Oh, I mean, Chips. Chips. Yeah, wow. yeah. I know mom's gonna love that. She's watching this every day. <laughs> we yeah. had an English Springer Spaniel named Kobe, actually. Dog's now dead though. Yeah, well, yeah, well. <laughs> anyway, from uh, the Chewy Quarter, to AI, <laughs> C3.AI. Dead stock there. here, Brad. Yeah, <laughs> shares of software company C3AI under pressure following disappointing guidance. The CEO noting current economic and political uncertainty, along with pervasive market passivism, lends to the company's inclination to set the expectations uh, a little bit lower here. And so... I think for this company and C3AI, particularly here, they're going to call out things like subscription revenue for the quarter, um, increase of 31%, the increase of 38% on their overall revenue for the quarter as well, $72.3 million compared to the $52.3 million one year ago. But again, it's going forward from here. Where does the company actually see some of that sustained growth? And I think the investors are hardly digesting or digesting and, and very hardly, I would say, some of that growth and where it's going to come from at this point in time when you had seen so many of the pandemic plays um, and C3 and anything having to do with the cloud or artificial intelligence or any of the apps that would be directly leaning on some of the C3 solutions and applications, those 
opportunities, it's, it's now gone fully organic. And if you haven't invested in that organic growth, it's really a question of, all right, where are those opportunities going to come from? I do like their logo. It's a very nice logo. Cool, couple, yeah, a couple of things worth noting here uh, as well. A friend of the show, Dan Ives over Wedbush, noting this is another debacle quarter and guidance. Um, the disappointment continues. He's, Ives is really, who has a neutral rating on C3AI, really taking this company to task and now saying the company's, quote, credibility in the eyes of the street have been damaged. Really disappointing uh, consistently in terms of results since they went public. But what bothered me, uh, another thing bothering me among many uh, things this morning, uh, Thomas Siebel, longtime tech executive, on the earnings call last night said they are seeing customers push orders back. When you see a veteran tech executive mm. like Thomas Siebel step up on its earnings call and say, hey, customers are a little cautious right now because of the economic environment, that is another one of those. You draw a box on your thing and you check it because that's a red flag too. Yeah, absolutely. Let's take a quick look at the markets here because one of the red areas uh, actually stems across the major averages right now, the Dow Jones Industrial Average. We were seeing this in positive territory across the board coming into the start of the trading session. And then you saw some of that slip up continue to happen after we heard from Microsoft and the their guidance, and then additionally, even more so, um, as we had heard more comments from the banks this morning, and we're going to get some Fed speak today as well, too. Well, uh, maybe Jamie Dimon uh, is starting to get his hurricane, uh, yeah. hurricane in the markets here, because that Microsoft guide down was ugly. And not a New Orleans hurricane, which is a very fun thing to think about, <laughs> but quite frankly, the other hurricane here on the market, Dow Jones Industrial Average slipping into negative territory, down by about two-tenths of a percent. S&P 500 lower by about 11 points, a quarter of a percent in decline there. NASDAQ Composite, you're seeing that down fractionally four tenths of percent there. We've got much more on today's early market activity. Yahoo Finance's Jared Blickery joins us from the floor of the New York Stock Exchange next. Welcome back to Yahoo Finance Live. Everyone here is a live shot. Little uh, time cool. lapse, actually. Love it. Outside of the New York Innovation. Stock Exchange, right down there on Wall and Broad. Let's get on over to the inside of the New York Stock Exchange. On the floor, we've got Yahoo Finance's own Jared Blickery. Jared, what are you seeing today in this early activity? 
Not seeing you here. I mean, you used to sit right over there. Sometimes I could see you out of the corner of my eye. Uh, I'm looking at the S&P 500 on the Wi-Fi Interactive today, and we've had three small down days. Uh, we don't know how today's closed just yet, but just want to give the perspective. It really doesn't matter what happens until we clear 4,200. Uh, that's kind of a line in the sand here. Also taking a look at bond market volatility. The move index shot up yesterday. Now this is reported on a closing basis, so we don't have today yet, but you can see that green candle on the right. We want to pay attention to that. And also, the dollar. Sazi, some great comments in the chat. Uh, Microsoft lowering their guidance, noting effects headwinds, just had a great conversation with the HPE exec. Here is the US dollar. Now you can see the longer term trend is definitely up here. On a short term basis, it is down. But I, yesterday, I don't want to belabor the point, but I went through a lot of charts on the dollar yesterday. And my thesis remains, I think we bumped up against some key resistance here, probably going to take a breather, but long term, we could be heading much, much higher. So maybe expect more of the same, but I'll tell you what, the dollar is a non-trending asset. It does tend to mean revert enough, so I think we have a situation where we're kind of in the clear for now. Also want to check out WTI crude oil because I'm not sure what the news here is on OPEC, but it looks like they're standing pat. This is a year-to-date chart, and look, look at this trend right here. For all the rumors that we have heard about increasing the supply, maybe Russia's going to be allowed to pump more. The fact is, OPEC Plus was not able to achieve their target last month, 2.7 million barrels short. So uh, the trend is up in crude oil, and if the dollar is holding pat, that is not a headwind for it. So we got to uh, take care to look at these commodity prices, which are surging, except for lumber. We took care of that yesterday, too. Uh, indeed we did. All right, Jared, Bitcoin, I know you are an avid watcher. Do we have an all clear sign there? Um, I don't know if it's all clear, but I'm encouraged by the price action. We're still, we've had some fake outs to the downside, some fake outs to the upside. And let's take a, let's take a check of our crypto heat map here. You can see there's a lot of red. It's down 6%, but it is in what I would call a holding pattern. Here's a one month chart, and you can see this is nothing but sideways action here. So I want to get above 35,000. I think that will be the beginning I'll, I'm not going to call that an all clear. I'll, t I'll call that at a later date, but I'm going to say that's the beginning of some very bullishness that I would have on my part. Jared Blickery, thanks so much. Okay, here are a few stats that surprised me as I read them off a Bank of America research note last night. AT&T is the 10th highest dividend-yielding S&P 500 stock. Shares have outperformed the benchmark index by 38% year-to-date, mostly since the company's Warner Media spinoff to Discovery. Okay, coming up, we've got our blue jeans on for this one. Well, sort of maybe. Levi CFO Harbeet Singh will join us for an exclusive interview following the iconic brand's Investor Day. Don't go anywhere.
Retailers are doubling down on cost-saving measures as inflation spikes, but also doing what they can to keep merchandise compelling for shoppers. Joining us exclusively following the company's investor day on Wednesday afternoon is Levi Strauss CFO Harmeet Singh. Harmeet, good to see you. Clearly you mean business today. You have the leather jacket on instead of the traditional Harmeet jean jacket. Let me ask you this. So I, your, your five-year outlook was pretty interesting. You plan to add, I would say, a little more than $3 billion in sales over the next five years. How, how do you get there? Yeah, sure. Um, Brian, thanks for having me. And uh, what I'm wearing is the uh, Mino uh, Cossack Classic jacket that uh, by Levi's that um, Albert Einstein wore for a long time in the 1930s. And we picked it up and a collection um, team, a vintage clothing team, uh, came up with a replica that we that uh, has sold really well. So to your question about, um, you know, uh, what gives us confidence about accelerating growth, um, you know, uh, we went public a couple of years ago. We run the company for the long term. The Levi's brand is the strongest it's ever been, as demonstrated by record gross margins and our market leadership position that we continue to grow. Structurally, we're a very different company today. We're more diversified. Uh, direct to consumer is 40% of our business. It used to be half that. You know, women's is a third of our business and accretive to gross margins. And uh, wholesale is healthier and a uh, lot more profitable. And financially, you know, we just reported the strongest year in 21 uh, in decades. Uh, our balance sheet is really strong. Our EBIT margins is not of 12%. So it's time to accelerate growth, accelerate profitability and commit to a high return of capital. Uh, what is going to drive the growth? A couple of things. Um, first, um, we have five brands. We acquired Beyond Yoga. Dockers uh, was uh, declining till a couple of uh, years ago. So all our five brands, as we reported in quarter one, are growing. Uh, casualization trend is here to stay. That is a great uh, tailwind. Uh, we believe we can double women's. We can double our tops business. We still sell three bottoms to uh, one uh, top. The ratio is one to one. And you know, our, our thinking is we can get to two to one by 2027. Uh, we believe our direct to consumer business, which is 40%, can get to 55%. Uh, we think we can open 400 new doors across all our brands over the next five years and continue to drive same store sales. Uh, we also, e-commerce is fairly underpenetrated for the company. It's uh, only 8% of our total business. It used to be 2% a decade ago, has grown during the pandemic, and we believe we can triple that. Um, and all the categories and areas we're looking at are um, high gross margin. So that drives uh, higher EBIT margin. And uh, today we're a little over 12%. Our view is by 2027, that becomes about uh, 15%, generating a lot of cash, which we start returning to uh, shareholders in the form of higher dividends and share repurchase program. Our board um, a couple of days ago approved uh, a share repurchase program of 750 million for the next couple of years. So that gives, you know, all these things give us confidence. Harmeet, I talked to you about a month ago uh, in New York City over at the NASDAQ. Things seem fine uh, with retail. And then since then, the bottom has dropped out. Inventories are piling up. We've had various warnings, profit margins under pressure. How is your current quarter looking? Yeah, you know, um, we report in a month. Uh, we don't guide quarterly. What I said yesterday in, in the investor meeting, uh, we ended our quarter in uh, on Sunday, so the ink is not dry. But we believe, based on trends we are we are seeing, we will meet our own internal expectations, and we've reaffirmed our annual guidance uh, that we gave out. Um, you know, when you reported Q1 which basically translates to 11 to 13% growth in revenue uh, relative to 2021 uh, and um, uh, an EPS of uh, between $1.50 to $1.56. So overall, because of the diversified, diversified nature of our business, uh, you know, we feel uh, fairly um, confident about affirming our full year guidance. Hey, Harmeet, Brad here. Um, when you think about the direct-to-consumer goals that you've set forth and the, that five-year target even, and the new doors that you anticipate opening even in the future as well, would that lead to a, a trimming of some of the retail partnerships that you have that are not run by Levi's? Yeah, no, it's a good question. Uh, uh, you know, we said 
Um, you know, one of our strategies, uh, our three cho uh, choices with DDC first, it doesn't mean DDC only. Uh, we have strong relationships with our retailers and customers around the world. They're a very important part of our business. Um, you know, our focus on direct to consumer is to drive the direct engagement with the consumer. We, you know, Levi's is becoming a more lifestyle uh, product, a head to toe look. You know, um, I'm wearing the Levi's shirt and the Levi's uh, jacket. Uh, so it's more than uh, pure bottoms. And direct to consumer and our own stores allow us to bring the assortments uh, to life. And that's why uh, we think opening doors and growing e commerce is important. Um, our uh, doors perform really well. The return on invested capital is in the high teens. Uh, and, um, you know, so it's profitable as well as allows us to showcase, uh, showcase and engage directly with the consumer. Um, and our wholesale customers are also, you know, uh, beginning to show more of a head to toe look for Levi's. And, uh, you know, we are focused on premiumizing, at least in the US, uh, the brand offer with wholesale customers as we expand relationships with Nostrum, with Target, et cetera. Okay, and so that starts to get into my next question, particularly around the type, the profile of customer that really kind of allows you to put out these targets and gives you the confidence to meet them over the next five years. Yeah, sure. You know, uh, 10 years ago, uh, the average age of, age of a consumer in the, in the U.S. Was, was older. It was in the high 40s. Today, it's a lot younger. So we are doing a great job. Um, you know, connecting with the younger consumer, the, mini, the millennials, the Gen Zs, especially as we, you know, drive more brand heat through collaborations. I was wearing a New Balance collaboration yesterday. We've got wonderful collaborations. And so, you know, our view is being a democratic brand across all our brands, we're connecting with consumers of all ages and demographics uh, around the world. Uh, and I think that's really what's helping us, you know, accelerate growth and uh, drive the direct engagement. We also are rolling out a loyalty program. Uh, you know, we have about 19 million, um, you know, loyal fans today. You know, our view is we can have a lot more loyal fans, but we're just bringing the rollout. We're seeing our loyal fans uh, engage, you know, more directly with us, more frequently with us. And I think that makes a big difference. Harmeet, I think the word you, you used yesterday with regards to pricing is you have taken surgical price increases. What does that exactly mean? And gene prices, they've gotten expensive. What type of increases have you taken? Yeah, no, you know, we, uh, we um, started taking price uh, increases about a year ago because, uh, you know, we were um, mindful of the fact that inflation probably is here and here, uh, you know, uh, for longer than was indicated. Um, our, uh, we ha the brand, because the brand and so strong has pricing power. But we are very mindful, Brian, about the price value equation. And our view is based on research that despite the price increases that we have taken, we uh, our, our brands provide real value. Our products provide real value to the, uh, to the consumer. Um, when, when I talked about, or we talked about surgical pricing, it is very important uh, to ensure that uh, when we price, we price for innovation, for value that we provide. So all our, as we introduce uh, new styles, our circular uh, 501, that was priced higher because it was, you know, it, it, it has organic cotton. It is something that a consumer needs and uh, is better for you. And, uh, you know, so from our perspective, those are the things that drive it. So when you think about surgical pricing, it's not taking a standard pricing increase across the board. That is something that we do, but that's uh, that last piece of action. We're also using AI and machine learning to decide what are the levels of markdown, what are the levels of pricing based on price elasticity that we see with different consumers. So it's, uh, it's very thoughtfully done um, and done in a very disciplined way. Armit, always a pleasure to speak with you and thanks for taking the time here. We're going to be keeping a close tab on the company and, of course, some of these targets that you've laid out. Levi Strauss, Enco CFO, Harmeet Singh, joining us here today on Yahoo Finance Live. Thanks, Brad. Thanks, Brian. You got Cheers. it. All right, guys, still ahead. We're keeping an eye on the markets as they take a hit following new guidance from MSFT, Microsoft. We're going to join you on the other side with a better idea of how that OPEC meeting as well is also moving the markets this morning. We are mixed right now. We're keeping a close eye on these major averages. We've got more on the other side of the short break.
Welcome back to Yahoo Finance Live, everyone. We just want to give you a quick check of the markets as the major averages have all touched and stayed in negative territory for much of today's early moments of the trading session. As of right now, 27 minutes into today's trading activity in the Dow Jones Industrial Average, right now is down by about 194 points. Just a moment ago, it was down by a little more than 200 points. Right now, sitting down by about half a percent, a little more than that. S&P 500, that's down half a percent. And the NASDAQ Composite, you're seeing that in negative territory by about three-tenths of a percent. We've got another hour of market coverage for you, including more insight into Meta's latest leadership shakeup. Yep, of course, parent company of Facebook there. And another fast food chain launching wrapper endorsed meals. All that and more on the other side of this short break. Sazi's excited. Dick Welcome back to Yahoo Finance Live, everyone. I'm Brad Smith alongside Brian Sazi. On this Thursday, June 2nd, Julie Hyman is out on assignment. U.S. markets 30 minutes into the trading session as the markets price in some more data on the employment front as the ADP private payrolls report that revealed 128,000 jobs added during May. That figure arrives ahead of the Bureau of Labor Statistics monthly jobs report. Let's also kick off the 10 a.m. hour with a look at the major averages here, which are pricing in even more data coming out and guidance revisions from Microsoft here. And as of right now, the Nasdaq Composite just barely holding on to some gains by the hair of its chinny chin chin, right now up by about two tenths of a percent. Dow Jones Industrial Average, though, still in the red by about four tenths of a percent. S&P 500 down two tenths of a percent. Also, coming up this hour, longtime Facebook parent, Meta Chief Operating Officer Sheryl Sandberg stepping down. What's next for the company as the tech behemoth sets its vision on making the metaverse a reality? Plus, Terra hasn't made the crypto winter any more bearable. Masari warned last year of the algorithmic stablecoin model, with the largest cryptocurrency by market cap Bitcoin hovering near its 52-week lows will get the outlook for the pathway ahead from the CEO of crypto economy data company, Masari. 
and enter the Kentucky Fried Jack. You won't find the latest collab with Jack Harlow on a streaming service, but you may see it on a drive through menu. In the latest fast food duo, the musical artist is teaming up with KFC. Yeah, we've got more on that later on in the hour. Let's get to Yahoo Finance's own Inez Ferre over at the Wi-Fi Interactive. Inez, great to have you here with us this morning. What are we seeing so far in the Great tape? to see you, Brad. We're taking a look at the NASDAQ 100 since you mentioned the NASDAQ up by its chin 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 uh, hair there. We are taking a look right now at Microsoft down 2% after Microsoft revised down its a fourth quarter outlook. Taking a look also at some of the gainers, though, with the NASDAQ, we are seeing Tesla up more than 2%. In fact, I'm going to pull this up so you can see a little bit with a clearer picture. Some of the laggards right now being uh, Moderna, Gilead, uh, some of the uh, vaccine makers and some of the healthcare stocks there. But we are seeing some of the gainers being uh, Ameli, uh, CrowdStrike, DocuSign. In fact, if we pull up ARC, we're seeing, look at this, uh, quite a bit of green for some of the, for the components in ARC. We are also looking at the meme stocks right now. We're watching GameStop after its quarterly results in that very, very brief earnings call yesterday, up more than 1%. And I just want to mention what's happening with oil because we just had some headlines uh, coming out of OPEC Plus. OPEC Plus uh, increasing its monthly hike and by surprising the markets by um, 50% for July and August. Uh, so uh, despite uh, those increases, we know that OPEC Plus has struggled really to meet its targets, though. So we are watching WTI trading uh, just above $116 a barrel, Brent crude also uh, just around $117 a barrel, guys. Ness Frey, thanks so much. All right, Meta is the hottest ticker on the Yahoo Finance platform. Our news of Sheryl Sandberg stepping down as COO. Let's dive into what this departure means to Meta's outlook. Jeffrey's analyst, Brent Thill, joins us now. Brent, good to see you as always. So lots of different paths you could take here. And, and perhaps one way uh, to maybe look at it, if you're an investor in, in here, this company is now going to shift major focus and resources to the metaverse. Well, the problem is the metaverse is not making any money, and it's really hard to define. How do you take it? Yeah, look, the, the Cheryl news is obviously uh, a blow given her commitment, but I think they have a, a clear leader who stepped in, has been there, and, and run uh, multiple aspects of the business. So we don't feel uncomfortable about the, that, that uh, but definitely a, a blow to, to um to the story in the interim. I, I think from the metaverse perspective, I don't believe that's the case. Um, I think there's an optical illusion that everyone's created that they're going after the metaverse uh, when the reality is the next, you know, call it next three plus years are gonna be all ad driven. Uh, there's no real new substitute uh, revenue stream that's gonna come in. So. If you think about other stories, you know, we talked about the analogy of Microsoft when they were the operating system company and they had to build Azure, which was their cloud infrastructure platform or the applications. Companies go through uh, pit stops and we think this is not uh, a pit stop that they do need to look for another revenue engine. They, they need to diversify the story, but make no mistake, the majority of the revenue is going to come from advertising for a long, long, long time. And they happen to have the best targeting engine on the planet to find our interest and in, in go after us. And that's why there's so many advertisers that want to be on the platform because they have, number one, the biggest reach on the planet of, of the num of number of users. And number two, they have the most sophisticated targeting engine. All you have to do is pull up Instagram and type in a few things and you'll instantly find uh, how good it is. And so that's going to drive the story in the interim. Yes, they're putting money in, in the next generation of the internet. Yes, they're putting money into Oculus and can they make money on this? We'll see. But I, I think that this concern and fear that they're going to blow all this cash because they're going after the metaverse is completely uh, overdone, in my opinion, because at the end of the day, right, it's still an ad driven model. And uh, we do think they're looking for a diversification engine and they need to do more and, and good for them to make the change and make uh, get the company on the right course to find that. But I don't think that they're they're out of. Uh, they're out of energy or or speed uh, or, or excitement from the advertising community. Yeah, you've had some blows from the Apple privacy chains. Yes, uh, you've seen some macro headwinds on on advertisers, uh, and we're concerned about the overall advertising market with the snap negative pre, uh, what what the Google comp, uh, the Facebook uh, you know comp, uh, which are all difficult, right, uh, coming out of the pandemic. So we're going through that, and I think that's the biggest issue. 
facing the global advertising industry is really just the macro slowdown, not the move to the metaverse. Hey, Brent, if I could take a step back for just a hot second here, considering the time period that Sheryl Sandberg was at Facebook and for the era that they were this advertising behemoth and the operations that for many of the cases being looked at as the adult in the room, if you will, that she had to make sure that this company was growing up and growing up quickly. When you think about her era, her time, how will she be remembered considering everything from the growth of their revenue all the way to some of the Cambridge Analytica data scandals and even to, let's be quite frank, the representation that she brought in the form of a woman at the head of a major Silicon Valley company and where the broader industry still needs to make strides? I mean, there's no question she had a massive impact. I mean, you know, I, I think ultimately every every company and every individual along the way is going to have uh, some downticks. And, you know, some of the things that you mentioned were clearly not a direct re reflection of, of her, but uh, you know, at, at a time, but I, I don't, I, I think ultimately she's going to be remembered as someone that made a huge impact uh, and clearly for, for female executives um, helped led the way. And I think ultimately you're seeing this now, a lot of the tech companies are still massively underrepresented, you know, in their top ranks with, with females. And, and obviously the tech industry is trying to change that. Um, look, I think ultimately the individual that's coming in to replace her has incredible experience uh, running, you know, the company's international growth products, number of initiatives. So uh, they didn't just pluck someone off the street that just came out of college. I mean, you have an individual now that's been in the company well over a decade and run multiple initiatives, including building the entire international business out for them. So I, I think, you know, if you look at uh, the, the, the issues uh, separate, uh, this is no question eight below, and she has had a massive impact, and there will be a uh, a massive hole left by her departure. Uh, but ultimately, I do think that either you know, this is one individual and they've got a talented bench and they pr they prove that, that they've got individuals that have been there for a long, long time that know the company, know multiple aspects of the business and can step in and, and lead. So uh, I, I don't I don't believe that this is going to be a massive issue. I think you're seeing that in the stock. The stock has not negatively reacted in a big way that many would think uh, given given her departure. Uh, but look, she put in an incredible amount of time, incredible, uh, uh, you know, experience and, and, and is, you know, had, had a massive impact on the company. Um, so I think, uh, you know, we'll see what, what ends up in, in terms of the next chapter. I'm sure she'll go on to do phenomenal things. Uh, but I, I don't believe, again, having covered tech for two decades, you know, the, the quick reaction is when someone like this of this caliber leaves that something's massively wrong. I, I don't I don't necessarily I'm not trying drawing that. I'm drawing the 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 line of hey, this looks more like Adobe, Microsoft, other great tech companies that that merely take a pit stop and are changing the tires and washing the windshield. And they're going to get back on the road. Um, how long it takes to get them back on the road, um, you know, is again the macro is coming in. The first thing that companies cut in a downturn is is the macro uh, is advertising. Brent, you mentioned, uh, you brought up a good point on terms of uh, female leadership. Now, out of all the tech companies you cover. Is there someone or, or a group of uh, leaders that might take that, that leadership baton away from uh, Sheryl Sandberg, that they can step up here and drive a lot of the key messages that she has been driving? Absolutely. So uh, there's two software CEOs in, in software named Amy, Amy Hood, uh, Amy Weaver, Amy Hood at Microsoft. Uh, I've, I've worked with Amy Hood for uh, you know well over a decade and I have incredible respect. Um, she is, uh, in my opinion, the single most important female exec uh, out there right now uh, in tech. And I, I'd say, obviously, close number two would be Amy Weaver at Salesforce.com. You know, not a traditional CFO, but came through the, the legal uh, community. And uh, again, everyone inside Salesforce.com knows that when Amy snaps her fingers, she can herd cats from Minnesota, uh, New Jersey, and Florida into a room in California in two seconds. She commands incredible respect and uh, is, uh, is an incredible leader. So I, I'd say right now, you know, those are the two that come to mind. There are others and uh, apologize for leaving the others out, but I'd say those are the two that really come to mind on the top of my list. Just quickly, kind of pivoting back to Meta, as we know that the ticker symbol is gonna change soon, how quickly does the revenue model also change now that you have some of the executive 
not just shake up, but more so the executive kind of change over here and the reprioritization of where that revenue is being driven that is clearly in line here at Facebook? It's a glacial change. It's, uh, as I said earlier, the, the advertising model is going to be here for a long time. So if anyone's looking for a massive inflection, uh, you know, the metaverse and all these creatures uh, roaming in this new world and in goggles and whatever else you want to call it, uh, it it's going to take forever. Um, so it's, it's really an ad driven model. And I think what they're trying to do again is what Microsoft, Adobe, other great tech companies did was find another revenue engine beyond just the core, right? Uh, my, uh, Oracle did this way back when they were a database company and then they moved into applications, right? Microsoft was the operating system company and then went into cloud infrastructure with Azure. Uh, they went into gaming, they went into other areas to diversify. So it took those companies, you know, years, if not decades to build some of these new businesses. Adobe with the Experience Cloud, they were the creative cloud, then they acquired their way into the Experience Cloud, which is one of the three main clouds they have. Uh, so again, the analogy is it's gonna take a long time uh, they can do it. Uh, we we believe that again. They have the user base. Yes, uh, TikTok is a threat for the younger audience, and my kids are not on Facebook. They're on TikTok. Yes, Snap is a threat. Uh, there are other uh, gaming uh, stories where you may end up going to the metaverse in other ways through other platforms than than Facebook going forward. So there's clearly a, a, a lot of risks ahead. But but again, I think when you think about the company and what they're what they've done, even with Reels, you know, they were way behind in what, what was happening with TikTok. And I think there's, there's signs that they're, they're starting to catch up and show more progress in, in a product like Reels. Uh, so, you know, never count them out. And, and ultimately, I think, again, this is gonna take a long time to figure out the revenue source from, from the metaverse. Yeah, they're plowing billions of dollars into it, but I think it's the right call because they need to make the move uh, and, and, and try to diversify. And so that's the risk. This diversification move may not pay off. I, I think it will but it's gonna take time to, to actually uh, show that. And the, the market doesn't like uncertainty. And so a lot of investors are sitting out saying, well, I'll, I'll wait to see the signs of the metaverse come. Uh, but again, I don't, I don't think you need to look at that. I mean, can you look at the advertising business and that, that's the single biggest driver. Brent, before we let you go, I caught a good note from you where you were crunching the numbers on the, the gating stock. So Match, Bumble, are companies like that recession proof? There's no recession in love. <laughs> you know, you need you need shelter, uh, food, and and love, and and I think you know in times like this, you kind of realize like the consumer's been going so hot and heavy uh, with with buying second homes, and you know you look at what's going on at the at the core, right? You need the community around you, you need friends and your family, and you need love, and and I think that we've said this that you know our headquarters in New York, there's a restaurant across the street, there's a, a margarita called the Mother of Dragons that's thirty dollars for one margarita, you know, the cost of a dating app is 15 to 30 bucks a month, right? So like, I look at that and I'm like, okay, you know, it, it's incredible the value that the daters get for what they pay. And, and again, I'm, I'm a 20 year old married guy with three kids. So I'm, I'm not, I'm not using these apps <laughs> full disclosure, but I talk to my friends that are single and, and other colleagues that are single that use it. And I think there's incredible, uh, value in, in what these companies have. I think they have incredible pricing power. I think they will be more recession proof because you go back to the, the core, are, are you going to take the, you know, the, the expensive trip to Asia, or are you going to spend 15 to 20 bucks to ensure the basics and things that you need when things are tough? So no one's immune in tech. Um, that's for sure. Uh, from the, the macro heads, heads, uh, you know, storms that are coming in on the macro side. But I think that you know, Bumble with with uh, their female first app, and they can diversify to uh, this this incredible thirty trillion dollar spend for females, and that's a really big opportunity. I really believe in, in what Whitney, the CEO, is doing and her vision long term. It, it's not happening short term, but they can unlock this female spending power. And then look at Match, global brand from eighteen years old to over fifty for the old fogies can date. Um, they they go. They have an app for every every uh, uh, lifestyle. They have an app for every geographic region in Japan, in Europe, in the US. Uh, they're incredibly well diversified and a new leader coming in a match from Zynga. So we'll see what he can do. Uh, but we, we like, you know, we like both stories and we think again, they're, they're more uh, recession proof than, than others. But, but again, no one's immune 
Uh, but we like we like both those names right here. Well, Brent, uh, we here at Yahoo Finance, we love you. We love your analysis. Sending you a, a, a digital hug through the metaverse right now. Jeffrey Zanel's Brent Thill. Always good to see you. Thanks. All right, before we head to break, I'm on double stock watch today after two key momentum names got slammed on Wednesday. First is Affirm, with shares plunging 14% on Wednesday as rival Klarna's challenges persist in a very public forum. Shares of Affirm rallying back today up about 8%. Meanwhile, Coinbase shares are also in focus as the stock got drilled by 12% on Wednesday. Amid a pullback in Bitcoin prices, shares are, are still about 22% away from their May lows and are down 73% year to date. Uh, Coinbase, Coinbase shares catching a bid so far today up about 3%. Coming up, one of the ugliest electric cars in the EV game is getting a price cut. Brad is back with more on that and other top headlines you need to know next. Some shock for the Chevy Bolt here. General Motors announced this week that it is slashing the prices of its 2023 Chevy Bolt. The automaker knocked 5,900 bucks off the EV to a starting price of $26,595.6300 off the larger EUV model to 28,195, 28,195. So the price cut, it comes as a surprise as EV makers, including Tesla, Rivian, Lucid, and even GM's own Cadillac have raised prices in response to rising commodity costs, specifically key materials needed for EV batteries. And the Biden administration is forgiving the student debt of another nearly 600,000 borrowers here. The Department of Education announced Wednesday that it will be canceling all the outstanding student loans for those who attended schools operated by Corinthian Colleges, formerly one of the largest for-profit colleges 
in the country. Now, the companies in the U.S. here, the face, they face lawsuits rather from the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau and Vice President Harris when she served as an attorney general in California for predatory and unlawful practices. About 560,000 borrowers will benefit from this latest round of debt cancellation, totaling around $5.8 billion, the largest single forgiveness action taken by the government to date. And three cheers for Queen Elizabeth II. Great Britain is celebrating the Queen's Platinum Jubilee, meaning she has spent 70 years on the throne. Coronated in 1953, Elizabeth's reign has spanned nearly the entirety of the post-World War II era. She has ruled during a plethora of historical milestones from Beatlemania to Brexit and alongside prime ministers from Winston Churchill to Boris Johnson. The festivities began this morning with a royal gun salute from the 104th Regiment of the British Army at Roald Dahl Plas in Cardiff Bay, Wales. Saz? All right, that is cool to see. Okay, short sellers have been making power moves during the market downturn. Yellow Finance's Alexander Semenova and Jared Blickery have been tracking this one for us. Hey, Jared, there you are. I thought I saw you at the New York Stock Exchange. I love to switch venues. I'm going right. to go upstairs. I'm going to be in the flash room pretty soon. But <laughs> we are here today to talk about retail stocks, consumer discretionary. This is a beaten down sector, but it does it has gotten a little bit, little bit of a lift off the ground recently, Alex. Yeah, Jared, short sellers scaled back their bets against consumer discretionary stocks last month in a sign that the hard hit sector may have found a bottom. That's according to new data from S&P Global Market Intelligence. Consumer discretionary was the top shorted sector during the month of April with short interest rising steadily since November. Let's take a look at performance here. Whoops. <laughs> I think it's, it's, this thing has a mind of its own. If we could get the Wi-Fi interactive back in this screen behind us, we'll be able to. There we go. There we go. We're back. Let's pull up the chart here. Okay, so this is the intraday price action, not telling us much, but what time frame are you looking at? Worth looking at the one year period here. So that uptick in short interest came starting in November. As you can see, the sector steadily falling uh, in November from its high. So uh, it, you could see that performance falling more than 30% before a slight rebound last week. Now let's take a look at the five year, five day period as well. You there's can see uh, there, there's a bit of a lift off here on Friday. The sector rallied nine percent, uh, leading the S&P 500 in that comeback that we saw last week, uh, still holding some of that momentum, but right. still well off of its highs. Well off of the highs. Let's let's take a look at the retail sector heat map so we can get an idea of what's going on today. And it looks like Amazon down. That's a Kahuna down about half a percent. So is Walmart seeing some action from Shopify. That's up four percent. I was down 3% yesterday, but what are you noticing here? Uh, Costco and Nike seeing some nice action here. Costco up 1%, Nike uh, up nearly 1% as well. All right, let's get a year-to-date look because uh, I think we can take a look at some of the carnage that has gone on in this sector. Now, here you see Amazon down 27.5%. You can pull up a, a one-year chart on this and look at this. It kind of fell off a cliff here. You take a look at the three-year chart and it's been going sideways and now it's at potential potential support back to this 2100 level. Anything standing out to you, Alex? Uh, just the continued pressure in this area of the market, of course, uh, getting worse after we saw some of those retail reports last week uh, that indicated companies were slashing their outlooks and are starting to feel the crunch from inflation. All right. Well, we're going to kick it back to you guys. All right. Good stuff. Jared Blickery, Alexander Semenova. Good stuff indeed. Now, let's get a quick check of the markets here right now, sponsored by our friends over at FlexShares. We're seeing all three major indices in the red, of course, uh, stocks are under pressure after that Microsoft warning. Worth noting, though, the Russell 2000 slightly in the green, but all eyes on that warning from Microsoft and what it may signal for many other tech companies and many other large companies over the next few weeks. Okay, coming up, Pfizer is making a push to get its COVID-19 vaccine into the arms of children ages six months to five years. We're back with more next.
Pfizer is making a push to get its COVID-19 vaccine into the arms of children ages six months to five years old. Yahoo Finance senior health care reporter Anjali Kamani has the details. Anjali. That's right, Brian. And we know that last week or a, couple, a week before we knew that the data came in from Pfizer, but now they actually have the fully filing uh, submitted to the FDA. And now we're going to wait until mid-June, of course, that June 15th date, where Pfizer and Moderna are going to get a chance to get in front of that FDA advisory committee and get their data heard and just, you know, hash out the details and see really if both or just one make it through, we know that the difference, as you can see on your screen, the data from Pfizer, they said they had an 80% efficacy uh, for uh, symptomatic cases, and that is based on three doses of their vaccine. Meanwhile, Moderna only looking at two doses and, and sticking to despite lower efficacy numbers that we saw in those two separate cohorts that make up that under five, under six category. So uh, really a lot to look at right now, and the, that committee is really going have a lot to wade through when it comes to this data for our, for those younger kids. But of course, we know that is the last remaining population, of course, that doesn't have a vaccine. So definitely have to wait and see what those details end up being. OK, so we know that these authorizations have moved forward either for a request for the approval or just by getting more data. But at this point in time, moving forward, when we think about when government subsidies stop for the purchases, what happens for people after that? Well, that has been the question, right? We know that, of course, that is on the table when it comes to Congress and, and a lot going on when it comes to what happens after will insurers continue to take that on? Will people be on the hook for that? And we know that's probably not going to be as popular. So obviously still a wait and see situation there. All right. Yahoo Finance's own Anjali Kamlani, health care reporter, joining us here to break this all down. Appreciate it, Anj. All right, guys, and coming up, Bitcoin is hovering around 52-week lows. We're going to chat outlook for cryptocurrencies and the stablecoin scandal. That's coming up next.
Is there more pain in store for crypto? Bitcoin is down right now by nearly 5% and has been fluctuating wildly this morning between 29,000 and 30,000. Other cryptocurrencies like Ether and Cardano faring worse, with investors still smarting from the pain investors saw over the last month. Most are wondering whether crypto winter will get worse. Joining us now, we've got Ryan Selkis, who is the Masari CEO, and we've got Yahoo Finance's own David Hollerith as well joining for the conversation. Ryan, first and foremost, we just got to know your perspective on the algorithmic stablecoin debacle that has taken place that is Luna, Terra, and ultimately what that does for the sentiment more broadly around crypto. Yeah, I mean, Terra was a, a unique example. It was very unfortunate. I think it's a black eye for the industry, and it's something that regulators and policymakers will latch on to, unfortunately. Uh, it doesn't change the reality of uh, the broader crypto market and its relative strength uh, in terms of uh, from a cycle to cycle basis. So obviously, we've seen some pain, uh, not just within crypto, but within all risk assets since the Fed started raising interest rates. Uh, crypto certainly has not been spared as, as one of the riskiest assets, one of the assets uh, asset classes for this out on the risk spectrum. But I think um, with Terra in particular, it's important to keep in mind this is one experimental currency that got way too big, way too fast, uh, arguably. And it is not necessarily an indictment of the rest of the stablecoin ecosystem, or certainly not the rest of the crypto ecosystem. Um, stablecoins are still one of the killer apps uh, of crypto, the, the fast settlement, the transaction volumes that we've seen that have rivaled uh, Visa in the last year, when you look at stablecoin transactions on Ethereum, for instance. Um, it's, uh, it's pretty incredible, the growth that we've seen cycle over cycle. We've had the luxury of being in a 12-year, 13-year bull market in general uh, in the economy. And uh, within crypto, this is kind of par for the course. We've gone in four-year cycles for you know, basically that entire duration. So this is not really something that's too alarming for those of us that have been around the industry for a while. Um, it is uh, something to, to keep an eye on, and, and, and I'm sure that we'll see some other projects struggle. But the industry in general, when it comes to human capital, when it comes to financial capital and venture capital, has been invested in some of this infrastructure. It's never been in a more solid position than it is today. Yeah. Hey, Ryan, uh, thanks for coming on the show. Um, I, I wanted to get back to sort of Terra, just kind of looking at that model. I know that you sort of uh, published some some insight into maybe the bear case for Terra uh, early on, uh, I guess, the end of last year. And, uh, you know, people uh, when they're financially invested in this, you know, come out of the gate with a lot of different opinions. And uh, the concept of whether or not there was any sort of fraud involved in the project, I think, is brought up plenty of times, you know, plenty of rumors about that. And I, I was curious, uh, you know, what your inclinations were there. And, and basically, if you could sort of, uh, you know, allude to that or maybe dispel that. I don't want to comment definitively either way, because I certainly haven't seen any evidence of fraud. Um, I, I do think that this is uh, Icarus flying too close to the sun. Uh, the, the project got mm -hmm. Uh, extremely large, extremely quickly, the, the total kind of assets that were being barred against the Luna um, uh, crypto token in order to create these stable coins uh, exploded from under a billion dollars in, into the you know, near, near $20 billion threshold in a matter of months. And um, if you look at the history of the project before then, it, it, it actually had a really interesting fundamental usage uh, in Korea in particular that was backing uh, this entire ecosystem and this, the stable coin uh, Terra USD. So, um, you know, more recently things got overheated. A lot of venture capitalists, you know, plowed a ton of uh, money in, into the ecosystem, and um, I think threw gasoline on a fire that was was already burning. Um, and uh, and then we saw what happens when reflexivity works the other way around, and and unfortunately it unwound, and, and a lot of people got hurt. So I do think. Um, it's a it's a teachable moment. It's certainly something that uh, the industry is going to have to do a better job of uh, in terms of disclosures, particularly around the centralized players uh, that are major holders, proponents and, and um, uh, advocates for these projects, whether that's the central foundations, whether that's the percentage. Uh, of these tokens, like we see in the in the public equity markets, um, yeah, there are some analogs that we should pull from securities regulation, uh, even if we're not actually treating all of these crypto assets as securities, uh, just for the, the safety and, and really the long-term health of the ecosystem. And Ryan, uh, shortly after the, the Terra, Terra USD started to sort of collapse, 
you published a, a bill of rights for um, crypto users, uh, and it was more of a proposal, but uh, could you sort of explain that in, in sort of the timing? Mm -hmm. Well, I think we don't want the baby to be thrown out with the bathwater and, and some regulators and policymakers that are a little bit more hostile to the industry right now are, are basically looking for any excuse to pull crypto under very tight regulatory regime. Um, many of the folks that are working in policy right now on the crypto side um, are you know, the groups that are backed by corporate entities. Um, and my point in the post was one of the, uh, one of the groups that's left out here is, is the end user. Um, so we need to make sure that when it comes to the ability to uh, self-custody assets uh, and, and kind of own a personal wallet or when it comes to the ability to actually use a decentralized finance protocol um, that those rights are not limited in any way, shape, or form um, by new policy that gets enacted uh, in the U.S. or, or you know, anywhere in the West, uh, et cetera. Um, so, uh, and this really comes down to, you know, constitutional protections, First Amendment, uh, you know, code of speech, Fourth Amendment, you know, no, no unreasonable search and seizures. And I do think that some of these things will ultimately be adjudicated in court because you will see um, more aggressive uh, policies get enacted that, that really kind of push the envelope, push the line here, and try to bring these decentralized uh, protocols under a more centralized hierarchical regulatory uh, regime. Um, that's inevitably going to lead to some conflicts. Uh, on the one hand, because policymakers want to protect people from another terra. On the other hand, the, the crypto proponents, myself included, arguing that this is a natural part of the evolution of any new technology. It's unfortunate. We need to do a better job you know, within the industry and, and helping protect newcomers especially. But you need to allow projects to fail, right? You, you know, capitalist systems uh, have failures and they have successes. And, and I think we've gone way too long, uh, personally speaking, as a country where we've propped up zombie corporations and, and entities that just have not been allowed to fail. Uh, and, and it's created a lot of deadwood in the system. And that's you know, one of the problems that we're going to be facing, not just within crypto, but within the broader economy the next couple of years. So. Um, a little bit of temperance is in order uh, versus uh, reactive policy for one catastrophic uh, collapse of, of a single asset. Right. Ryan, pleasure to have you here with us this morning. we got to leave things there for right now. That's Ryan Selkis, who's the Masari CEO, as well as David Hollerith, Yahoo Finance's own, joining us for the conversation. And everyone coming up on the other side of this short break, KFC flying first class with rapper Jack Harlow. The rapper joins the chain to launch a Kentucky Fried Partnership. More on that coming up.
Another day, another fast food and celebrity partnership. KFC is partnering with rapper Jack Harlow for a new meal called, of course, the Jack Harlow meal. Yahoo Finance's Alexander Canal has the details on this one. And uh, Ali, I'm going to try to do I'm going to try to do the, the Jack Harlow when I ask you this question. Like, uh, there's nothing different. There's nothing different about this menu. It's just they took a combo menu, put it together, and slapped his name on it. Exactly, Saz. And this was something, this is a partnership that was first struck in December. So this is a continuation of that partnership. Now, Jack Harlow is a Kentucky native. He's from Louisville. He loves KFC. So he basically handpicked a lot of these menu items, as you mentioned. We got a spicy chicken sandwich. We got mac and cheese, secret recipe fries, a side of ranch, very important, and a lemonade. So he really wanted to combo some of the newer items that KFC has introduced over the past few years, like the spicy chicken sandwich, along with those classics like the mac and cheese. But this comes as a lot of these fast food brands are leaning into celebrity partnerships. Of course, we know McDonald's. They're known for their famous orders campaign. They've partnered with celebrities like BTS, Travis Scott, Saweetie. We have Burger King with their own iteration called the Keep It Real Meals. They're targeting celebs with stage names like Nelly, Lil Huddy, who's a TikTok star. And then, of course, we got Make the Stallion, Popeyes, Lil Nas X, Taco Bell, Ooh. and the list goes on and on. So this Lil is really- Lil Little Huddy? Little Huddy. Top of your play, Huddy. Little Huddy. Little Huddy. He's a TikTok star. Oh, I'm so old. But but <laughs> no, but that's that's the whole point. They really want to attract these younger types of consumers, and it's sort of a follow the leader approach. McDonald's did it first. It worked for them. They've cited in several earnings reports that their famous orders campaign led to an increase of growth, an increase in sales. So I don't think this is going to slow down. Oh, Brian, you didn't know who Little Huddy was. I didn't. Come on. They, Come they on. need a fabulous partnership from me and <laughs> yes, Sazi. That yes. was the playlist she this was morning. Da- the he show. was dating Charlie. Emilio. So, you know, there's like a whole TikTok universe. I don't think they're still together. I don't know. I'm not totally in the TikTok world, but... Well, Those creation houses. That, yeah. That's, that's the collaboration. You know, it's like, a, it's a G- Gen Z. They okay. just, they love these things. I mean, I, and of course, there was the one we were talking about the other day with Taco Bell and uh, the new pizza that they were doing, that they mm-hmm. were going to do a partnership with, uh, who was it, Dua Lipa? Or not Dua Lipa, uh, well, Doja they, Cat. Doja Cat but and Dolly Parton were going to do the right. musical. Right. And they had to pull that. They had to pull the Mexican pizzas because they were overselling them. So, you know, we're, we're seeing a lot of this happen these days. And of course, they have that continued partnership with Lil Nas X. He's the chief impact officer or something. Yeah, I, I need my about. own partnership. I got to drop my line, my guy over at uh, you should. Papa John's. The, amount, the, the, the amount big of times sauce. You the big talk sauce. about fast food. Yeah, chains. I want the big sauce promo deal from uh, Rob Lynch over at Papa John's. He's a CEO. Give You're me an a, influencer. Yeah, in yeah, the give, me finance a 30, world. give me a 30 inch one slice piece of cheese pizza with, a, lar- with a large bottle of water so I can take pictures of Instagram and just blow up over it. There you go. That's the sauce meal. The big sauce. The big piece, one slice pizza. Yeah. I love it. Stick around. I think you're going to want to stick around for this one as well. (laughs) We're continuing to talk the eats. Drinking coffee is apparently really good for you. And this is great for Sazi. A new study that shows that coffee lengthens your life, reduces risks of dementia, and boosts your mood. It is no surprise at all. That's where you find Sazi's take. Sazi, you drink a fair bit of coffee. Yeah, I think Lil Huddy drinks a lot of coffee too. So we're going to be, whoever that is, we're going to be living for the next uh, 450 years. But a good uh, couple new surveys out. One from the Annals of Internal Medicine, uh, that survey is saying uh, if you drink 1.5 to 3.5 cups a day, even with sugar, which is you know interesting, you were 29% to 31% less likely to die than non-drinkers. So you will live longer, at least according to this survey, if you drink a good amount of coffee. And another one from the JAMA uh, Internal Medicine Group. They are saying, they looked at people, and there I am. And that's that my coffee. coffee order? That is a live picture <laughs> of my coffee this morning. Now that is 31 ounces of coffee that cost me $8.80, right? $8.80 pre-tax from from Starbucks. Now, if you can guess how, if you can guess how many uh, ounces, uh, what else is in that drink, I'll send you a Yahoo Finance hat. So please tweet me your replies. But look, this other study, uh, they looked at uh, folks that drink one cup of coffee a day, other people who drank eight cups of coffee a day, which is really... Where are you oh in that range? I, I'm more closer to like 14. We'll, we'll take that off. We'll, <laughs> uh, sure, we'll take that offline. But uh, both of those groups have a lower risk of death versus non-drinkers. And it's very interesting. Now, you see studies like this. I've seen tons of these through the years. Your first thought, if you're up there trading on the Yahoo Finance platform, or whatever you're inclined to do in, in your morning, only go out and buy some of these coffee stocks. Well, they've all been hit. Of course, yeah. we talked to Dutch Bros CEO a couple weeks ago. Its stock declined, I believe, 37% on its earnings day. Uh, Krispy Kreme donut, really, that is the only coffee stock that's been taking on or has been gaining of late McDonald's shares under pressure. 
All of these companies at the end of the day are fast food chains dealing with labor pressures, the inability to find labor for their workforce, and the inability to push through higher prices for lots of these items. Hence, even though coffee might be good for your health, they still have to sell a lot of other things on these menus to drive sales and profits. Well, Krispy Kreme introduces a new donut every other week, so mm -hmm. perhaps that's what's driving people back in there. And when you think about the number of these chains that, yes, on the labor front, it is highly competitive for them, just being able to retain employees, having people show up for work, and then what the payment is, quite frankly, looking like as well. I mean, that's highly competitive. But again, it's just going to come down to supply chain, to being able to get enough of the ingredients that you need for a day-in, day-out basis. Can we show that picture? I want to show that picture of the, my coffee again. Can you guys guess how many ounces that was? Oh, it was, it was easily 20. 32? Toronto. That's a 30. 31. That is the Trenta size. Yay. That is the largest size cup you can get well, at Starbucks. Well, you're getting the hat. I'm so, going to get the hat thank out. Thank you. And yeah. you know what? I was going to talk about the return of the office because mm -hmm. I do think I've you know, ordered way more coffee out now that we're going into the office than I was before. I was brewing my own coffee. I felt so domestic. But I think I, I think that's a part of the reason why that's we're seeing some of the, that slowing growth there. Yeah, no, People it's, aren't it's, going it's, to the it's office true. Right. Breakfast has been a, a huge, it's usually historically a, a huge category. And in many respects, it is viewed as a leading indicator inside of fast food, fast food companies. Once you start to see breakfast coming back, the likes of Burger King. I know you're a fellow Croissant Witch fan. Once you see those sales picking up, it's actually a good economic sign. I am a Breakfast Wars advocate here. That's the only thing I will advocate. All day breakfast. Article. All day breakfast. Done deal. Yep. Thanks so much for sticking with us. Of course. It, Allie. Everyone's still ahead. We're taking a big look, one last look at the markets here as we're mixed right now on the other side of this short break. The Blue Oval is bulking up its workforce. Ford Motor is adding more than 6,000 jobs as it retools factories to focus more on producing electric vehicles. The move will also help Ford build traditional gas-powered cars. Here with more, we've got Pras Subramanian. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. Help us break this down, Pras, for Ford and why they're taking this move. 
So today, 3.7 billion for, for new jobs, that's 6,200 new hourly union jobs. They're converting 3,000 other temp workers to union jobs. This is kind of a big deal in a non-UAW negotiation cycle, kind of throwing them a bone uh, as they invest more in the gas-powered cars as well as some electric cars. So, you know, um, they announced a new Mustangs coming up, which we knew about. New Ford Ranger mid-size pickup, we knew about, but they're adding more uh, production capability for the Ford Lightning and also a new Ford Pro EV van, kind of like they already have the e-transit van, but it's more like for like commercial uh, lower range, probably like last mile delivery, stuff like that. So they're doing, they're doing these investments today. Also on a day where they announced um, uh, May sales came in a little bit below what they were last year, but to be expected given how things are with production and um, chip shortages. Things Remember like those that. old school Ford Vans, Pros, the, the mid 80s where you could sleep in? The Econo lines? Oh, yeah. I always <laughs> wanted those. My parents could never afford it. Those things were great. They were fun to play with in the dealership, but very important uh, initiative, no doubt about it. But you know, as this push to EV comes, not just Fords, Volkswagen, all these guys, don't you just need less workers? There's less parts in these cars. Yeah, I think that's sort of what's going on here with this investment in these new workers, converting people to um, in states that are union states versus the electric plants, which will be in states that are non-union states. So I think this is a way to compensate for that. But you're right, Saz, these, these are, you need fewer workers to make electric motors, much more less, less complicated. So I think there's going to be an issue, a sort of a come to Jesus moment in a few years where what do you do these excess workers? Of course, this also comes with the broader kind of mindset and conversation around where there have been certain benefits that companies who engage more with the UAW, and particularly this has been Ford and GM, mm -hmm. that have gotten more of that attention, especially from the White House as well. What does it mean for other companies like a Tesla out there too? You know, it's Ford, GM, and Stellantis that use UAW workers, right? The, all the other manufacturers work in states that are, are right-to-work states where they don't need to have them. So um, the White House is going to, rightfully so, from their point of view of their constituents, is going to support these UAW factories and, and automakers. So if you're a VW or Tesla, you're kind of still on the outside looking in. But as they grow and they expand in this country, the White House has to notice, and, and I think they are starting to do that, so, trying to basically talk about these non-union companies as well. And you like the new F-150 Lightning? I think it's great. Yeah, I think it's a really capable product, and I think it's a, it's, a, it's a win so far for them. Well, if it has your stamp, I may go out and get one. Yahoo Finance's senior auto correspondent, Pras Subramani. Good to see you. All right, coming up, Akiko Fujita and Brian Chung will be joined by Cecilia Rouse, chair of the Council of Economic Advisors, to chat, to chat the latest on the president's inflation fight. Let's get one more check of the markets, though, before that happens. You're seeing the Dow down almost 150 points uh, as traders fret about that Microsoft profit and sales warning. Do not go anywhere, Yahoo Finance Live. We'll be right back.
Welcome to Yahoo Finance Live. Happy Friday Eve. I'm Brian Chung. I, I thought you were going to say Friday. <laughs> no, not Friday no, not yet. yet. It is my Friday, by the way. She's I'm Akiko tomorrow. Fujita. Let's do a quick check of how the markets are right now. 90 minutes into the trading day, a bit of a split picture. We've seen the Nasdaq, the only one in the green, and there we see the S&P 500 just kind of trading pretty flat. The Dow down 118 points. We've also been watching the bond yields today on the back of disappointing private payroll numbers. We're going to get to those numbers in just a bit, but let's turn our attention to oil. Um, some big moves there on that. That front today, Brian, because we saw OPEC Plus agreeing to increase output faster than expected by roughly 650,000 barrels a day. Now, it's important to note 650,000 is not a lot when you consider that more than roughly a million barrels a day have been taken offline because right. of Russia, the conflict with Ukraine. Uh, but this is a big reversal for Saudi Arabia. Well, it's a big reversal. And we have to keep in mind that that 648,000 barrel a day announcement from OPEC Plus, one of the more boring streaming services, in my opinion, is actually more oh, than expected. Do you get it? Joke. Plus, we okay, we joke. got a joke. Yes. Yeah, but yes. uh, it was more than expected. So regardless of how you kind of cut it or slice it, that increase in supply you would hope would be better uh, for oil prices, which have remained extremely elevated. Uh, however, we did see crude oil uh, in both Brent and regular measures uh, go up in the wake of that announcement. Crude oil now at about 100 to $15 a barrel, keep in mind, very elevated and basically back up to those highs that we had seen uh, earlier in March. Well, and we're seeing that move because I think the market understands that this is not going to make a huge dent when you think about the, the shortage that's now been created as a result of a lot of Russian oil coming offline, the Western sanctions, which could increase, you know, or decrease output by as much as two to three million barrels a day. Now, it, important to note this point on Saudi Arabia, though, because there is a bit of a thawing that's happening. The fact right. that Saudi Arabia moved, obviously, their de facto leader of OPEC, the fact that they moved points to the fact that they are hearing the U.S. demands. Of course, there's been a lot of conversations behind the scenes. There's reports today from Bloomberg that President Biden is a now meeting, considering mm -hmm. a visit to Saudi Arabia next month. And just keep in mind, like, we've been talking about the supply demand issue, and yet Saudi Arabia, at least publicly, has maintained that there's no real genuine shortage and we've seen the shift today. So not significant when you consider. But you do wonder if that tone might be starting to change. And again, it might, it's very obvious if that meeting does happen between Biden and uh, Saudi Arabia, what the goal of that meeting is going to be. Uh, but want to shift to something else that we're watching as well. And that is, of course, the news that broke yesterday afternoon regarding a big leadership change at Facebook with Chief Operating Officer uh, Sheryl Sandberg stepping down from Meta. That's after 14 years at the company. Akiko, obviously a giant uh, in that company, building it up to a global titan in the, in the tech and business world. But look, her legacy also involves uh, being a leadership icon through her, her book, Lean In. And, but at the same time, there's also kind of a shroud of criticism around her tenure there because of all the privacy, antitrust, Cambridge Analytica scandals that really engulfed the company over the past few years. Well, and she's kind of been the face, you know, some would say the punching bag for the company going out there and defending, you know, it's whether it is about their content moderation policies, whatnot, you know, just all of that. But there's the legacy story, but there's also the question about where this leaves the company. And it comes at a really interesting time. We've seen growth moderate in a big way. They're facing a lot of competition from those like TikTok, increasingly so. And then, of course, there's the big pivot that we've seen from this company, at least a public, piv public pivot, changing their name from Facebook to Meta, doubling down on the metaverse. And there's been several reports just leading up to all this that Sheryl Sandberg wasn't necessarily, maybe not on board with that big change that Mark Zuckerberg is trying to lead. And at the core of that question, though, is how much power did Sheryl Sandberg have in addressing a lot of those crises? And there's been a kind of uh, an interesting narrative that's been going on about ever since essentially they brought Nick Clegg in to address some of the policy issues, whether or not that was kind of the beginning of some of the erosion of Sheryl Sandberg's power and say within the company. And you do wonder with the restructuring that's been going on, uh, not necessarily just in the C-suite, but around this whole transformation of Facebook becoming what was once just a social media website to uh, this grand aspiration for a large metaverse, whether or not Sheryl Sandberg's role in that company was also being shrank during that transformation 
transformation. Perhaps that's the reason why she announced that she's going to be uh, stepping down, but of course does also raise the other larger question of how much power does Mark Zuckerberg now have with her leading the company, something well, worth watching. And we should point out Javier Olivian is stepping into this role, but it's, it's a some different would argue, role. a reduced role right. because there are some things that were under Sheryl Sandberg's umbrella that aren't necessarily going to be there anymore. HR is going to be one of them. The legal team's also being placed under Mark Zuckerberg. So it's it's an evolved role. We're going to continue to follow that and see. We haven't seen a significant, I was going to say not a significant reaction right, right now, but we're seeing this is the, the one year. Yeah, right. uh, um, well, 2.6% 2 .6 today, but yeah, I mean, look, yeah. this is a company that's had a tough time this year. Um, let's turn our attention now to the labor market. Private sector employment decelerated in May, adding just 128,000 jobs last month. That marks the slowest pace of job growth in the pandemic recovery, and it comes as investors brace for that all-important non-farm payrolls number. Uh, let's bring in Cecilia Rouse. She is chair of the Council of Economic Advisors. Cecilia, it's great to talk to you today. Um, you know, when we talk about the deceleration that we saw, at least in private payrolls, that kind of points to what we heard from the president earlier this week in that op-ed. He said specifically that the average monthly job creation could shift in the next year from current levels of 500,000 to 150,000. That would be in line with the next phase of the recovery. So what should Americans be expecting right now in terms of a slowdown? Well, look, um, as you highlighted, we've had a historic recovery in the past year from the pandemic, where we've had some of the fastest job growth ever in the first year of a presidency. Unemployment has come down faster than it has at any other time since data were recorded. Uh, labor force participation is nearly back to where it was pre-pandemic. Um, just today, we got unemployment insurance claims. They're the lowest that they've been since uh, the 1970s. So we know that we've got a very strong labor market, uh, but we also know that that is not what is consistent with a strong, stable, steady, steadily growing economy. That when an economy has reached basically reached full employment and is growing steadily, uh, that we expect to see job growth more in the 150, 200, you know, in that range. So uh, we, we know that our labor market is very strong. You know, when the Federal Reserve considers its dual mandate of uh, stable prices and full employment, uh, Chair Powell has said he believes the labor market is too hot. So one, he would like to see uh, the job growth slow down a little bit. But even beyond that, once even once inflation is under control, we would expect to see job growth to moderate. And that would be more consistent with the kind of economy that President Biden really envisions. For the United States. Uh, Cecilia, it's Brian Chung here. Are you already seeing a moderation within some subsectors of the labor market when you consider that the ADP report today, which again, different than the BLS report that we'll get tomorrow, detailed actually a contraction in non-farm private employment among uh, smaller businesses, specifically those with only one to 19 uh, employees. We saw a contraction not just in May, but in previous months as well. Is the story for small businesses very different than those for large businesses? Well, we are going to have to wait to see, you know, ADP does not track, uh, you know, one for one with the data that we get from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. We know from the JOLTS data that we uh, saw yesterday uh, that uh, job vacancies remain very solid. Uh, people are still quitting jobs, which suggests that they're quitting jobs, taking better jobs. Uh, employers are still, uh, you know, filling jobs at a very rapid clip. So we, you know, there's always been some, there's always heterogeneity, there's always some difference across the labor market. We will know more tomorrow when we see the data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Cecilia, it does feel like there's been a bit of a shift in tone coming from the White House. We heard the president say on inflation specifically, he respects the Fed's independence. We know that's always been the case coming from the White House. But he's also said that it's up to Congress as well. And I wonder if if this messaging is essentially the White House saying, look, there's not a whole lot that we can do at this point to make an immediate impact in driving infl inflation down. What the president is trying to articulate is one, not every president has respected the independence of the Federal Reserve Board. So this president is saying he understands that the Federal Reserve has got a, a difficult job ahead. Uh, and he respects their, their independence and he respects what they need to do and, and what they seek to do. So that's one. Two, the president is very focused on inflation and he is doing what he can with the tools that he has available. But part of that, uh, in addition to what he can do administratively, whether it's uh, releases from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, but importantly, his economic agenda really 
is about increasing economic capacity, which is how we lower these kinds of price pressures going forward. And that is what underlies his legislative agenda for which he needs the participation of Congress. That is where he's focused on lowering prices for the items that households spend, you know, 80% of their budgets on, whether it's healthcare, childcare, uh, you know, energy costs. We know we need to transition to a clean energy system. We know that we need to be, re, uh, you know, refilling the coffers of the, of the federal government. So the president is talking about his economic agenda really his, has been about the long-term capacity of our economy so that we can generate the kind of growth that supports good paying jobs for average Americans where they are seeing increases, which they haven't seen for the last several decades, increasing economic capacity so that we've got a very healthy economy going forward. Uh, you mentioned energy, but uh, I guess I'm wondering if there are other levers that the administration can pull, like, let's say, for example, tariffs. So if there is, for example, uh, inflationary pressures coming from the tariffs that were imposed by the previous administration on Chinese goods, uh, is that something that you would be advocating to take down to lower prices here in the United States? The president is looking at a range of options, including strategically rolling back some of the tariffs on Chinese goods, but he wants to do so in a way that makes sense for the US economy, for the US consumer, for the US worker, uh, and that is also consistent with working with our allies abroad and, and you know, it's, so it's in a strategic fashion. But absolutely, the president is, is considering all levers uh, that are at his disposal, uh, that are at his disposal in a way that makes a lot of sense for the U.S. economy. C Cecilia, real quick, why hasn't it why hasn't it taken this long to make a decision on tariffs? I mean, this is some would argue the single lever that the administration can pull, and you've said your own analysis has pointed to the fact that it could drive inflation down in some manner. So, the, you know, the president has been a very busy man. Uh, we've been managing a pandemic and now we have this war, uh, Russia's war on Ukraine, uh, which is a very complicated situation and which is really responsible for the latest increases in our energy prices. And so the president wants to take a considered uh, look at these tariffs and do so in a way that is consistent with our global position in an economic framework, that is uh, consistent with our you know, geopolitical uh, strategies, and that makes a lot of sense for the U.S. economy. Cecilia Rouse, it's great to talk to you today. I really appreciate the time, a Chair of the Council of Economic Advisors. Well, time now for a market check sponsored by Flex Shares. We're now seeing uh, green across the board here. The Nasdaq leading the gains up more than 1%. The S&P 500 up 18 and the Dow up 11. Well, coming up on the other side, the run on Stablecoin, Project Terra and Luna sent shockwaves throughout the crypto industry. One top regulator offering his thoughts. That conversation is coming up next.
Twitter. Following the collapse of stablecoin Terra and its sister token Luna, one top regulator is warning that investing in cryptocurrencies is dangerous for investors with modest means. Acting Comptroller of the Currency Michael Su says hype is a serious risk for cryptocurrencies and warns that certain activities within crypto, crypto, namely yield farming, could be akin to a Ponzi scheme. He joins me now to discuss these issues and what regulators should do now. Comptroller Su, welcome back to the program. It's great to see you. Thanks for having me, Jennifer. So I want to start off the conversation with your reaction to the collapse of Terra Luna. It appears they're trying to resurrect Luna, albeit not that successfully. But there are a lot of question marks about what really happened here. From your viewpoint as a regulator, what do you think caused the run? And should uh, federal regulators be investigating this? So I think the, the, the Terra Luna collapse has revealed a number of things, but I really want to focus on three. You know, the first is stable coins are not stable. Clearly, to have an $18 billion stable coin uh, 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 crash so quickly, I think, showed that. Um, second, a lot of the growth in crypto is driven by hype. You know, part of the reason that uh, uh, Terra was able to grow so quickly, uh, it was hyped, and there were some, some very attractive yields that were not sustainable uh, put onto it. And third, contagion risk is real. You saw the sell off lead to both a broader sell-off in the cryptocurrency market generally. I think a half a trillion dollars of value uh, was lost in a relatively short period of time. And you saw some pressure on another stable coin, uh, Tether, which is not algorithmic. And you know, Tether briefly depegged. Um, and so I think that that really, I think some of these lessons just kind of reveal some fragilities in that space that everyone needs to be really careful about. Yeah, Comptroller, see, one of the major draws of investing in Terra uh, was depositing it for higher returns, kind of akin to that yield farming, which you've uh, linked to a Ponzi scheme. Do you think that Terra Luna was a Ponzi scheme? So um, there was a, uh, a, a crypto hedge fund manager who said, if you can't figure out where the yield is coming from, it's probably coming from future bag holders. Those are his words. And I think that is something to kind of bear in mind. There's been a lot of hype, a lot of yields, which I pointed out over a year ago to say, if you, where are these yields coming from? You should really understand that. That's very important to protect investors if you're investing in this space to understand these things. And that's very important to me and to us in the regulatory community is protecting people. Uh, this, is, this is big enough now where this is an important thing that we have to pay attention to. Yeah, and I want to follow up on what you said on contagion. Obviously, there is contagion risk within crypto. We didn't see that spread this time to the traditional financial system. Uh, but if there were to be a bigger run, perhaps, uh, how worried are you about this infecting the traditional financial system and the potential for systemic risk? So uh, we have taken a, a careful and cautious approach to crypto. Uh, as, as you know, and your, your listeners know, the OCC supervises national banks. So it's about 1,100 banks, $15 trillion in assets, and our mission is safety, soundness, and fairness. So anything that's done in the national banking system has to be safe, sound, and fair. Can crypto be done in a safe, sound, and fair way? Yes, but they have banks have to show us. They have to prove it. And so we've taken this approach where if a bank is going to do this, uh, anything in the crypto space, they have to demonstrate to us it's going to be safe, sound, and fair. I think that standard that we've applied has really helped to keep these issues contained within the crypto universe and to not infect the traditional banking system. Uh, and I'm proud that you know I, I did encourage the FDIC, I sit on the board there, uh, to kind of follow in the OCC's footsteps uh, to take that approach uh, to banks in crypto. So is the best way to protect the banking system from risks to crypto to limit its exposure? Uh, and if so, uh, given what's happened, uh, is the OCC less inclined to issue uh, specific special bank charters for financial institutions to engage in crypto? So uh, our chartering authorities and the standards we use are going to be the same no matter what. So you know, there's a wide range of business models for banks. And so we, we don't have a one size fits all um, uh, in terms of that, in but in terms of the standards, 
safety, soundness, fairness, compliance with laws and regs, protecting consumers, all of that is part of the uh, what we evaluate when we look at charters. And we hold all banks to the same standards on that. So we're open, uh, again, we're open-minded about you know, who wants to get a charter and what they want to do with it. We're going to kick the tires on it to make sure uh, it's safe, sound, and fair. So that's still open for you guys, just to be clear. Uh, again, we're 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 open-minded on charters. Um, now, I think that to be to be clear, um, I have prioritized that I am especially uh, sensitive to arbitrage uh, races to the bottom, and so I want to make sure that the way we exercise our authorities and decisions around charters don't lead to uh, regulatory arbitrage or races to the bottom, and that's another uh, important set of priorities for me. Comptroller Sue, uh, when we look at the Terra Luna crash, it seems to have elements of what occurred in the financial crisis. People were searching for high returns. They didn't read the mm -hmm. fine print. Uh, they didn't understand what they were investing in. Uh, $40 billion has evaporated. It doesn't seem like we have the luxury of waiting for Congress to act here. Why aren't you, why aren't regulators using your current authorities to write rules now and to protect investors? So there are a lot of discussions taking place right now um, amongst the regulatory community, me and my peers. Uh, as you know, the uh, FSOC has identified kind of the crypto uh, world as something that uh, the Financial Stability Oversight Council, of which I'm a member and others are paying attention to. The White House put out an executive order, uh, which requires some reports about what's going on out there, what are the risks, how are we gonna approach that? In the meantime, uh, there's a lot of coordination amongst the agencies on particular areas where we can focus and stable coins has been one of them. There was a President's Working Group report which also included the OCC and the FDIC, which lays out some objectives, you know, making stable coins stable. How do we do that? Uh, ensuring that there's interoperability. Um, you know, those, those are really, really important, and we're all working on those now. Comptroller Sue, thanks so much for your insight. So appreciate it. Hope to speak with you again soon. Thanks so much. We really appreciate the opportunity. Acting Comptroller of the Currency, Michael Sue. Coming up next, Brian and Akiko break down GameStock's earnings. Stay with us.
Welcome back to Yahoo Finance Live. Time now to look at the two stocks that's moving today. And we're starting with Microsoft. You see it's lower, down about 1.7%. And Brian, this is really all about a weaker outlook coming from the company and something we've heard from a lot of companies recently, which is the headwinds, FX headwinds. We heard it from Salesforce yesterday. Microsoft also reiterating that today. Yeah, this coming from uh, an AK filing, which Microsoft filed about five weeks after reporting their earnings, saying that there's an unfavorable foreign exchange rate movement, lower their guidance for both profit and revenue because of those currency headwinds. You could see the stock not moving too, too much, about 1.7%. It had fallen earlier in the day, which actually led to a blinking in overall markets as well. But Akiko, you know, we've been talking about this story just as recently as yesterday because uh, Salesforce said something similar. But really what we're talking about here is the strength in the overall dollar, which you can see over a six-month basis up about 6%. Now, you've actually seen it kind of decline a little bit, which mirrors what the US dollar looks like against the euro. But what's been really interesting is the rip up that we've seen in the US dollar strength against the yen. Take a look at the currency pair on this front, where you've actually seen the appreciation up about 15%, with one US dollar getting about 130 Japanese yen, perhaps one big reason behind the Microsoft update today. I mean, that is brutal just to see, right? 130 to the dollar. And we heard yesterday Mark Benioff talk about how it's a great time for Americans to go shopping in Japan. But these are real headwinds that these companies are seeing. We often think about just the dollar, but they do operate in other currencies too. And with that exposure comes the weaker outlook. Yeah, and we have to remember too that one big reason why the currencies are moving here is because of interest rate differentials. You have a number of central banks raising rates, and it's not like Microsoft is going to say, well, this is the Federal Reserve's fault, but obviously with the Federal Reserve raising interest rates and the Bank of Japan effectively stuck where it's at, well, that means that more money is going to go into U.S. dollar denominated assets. That makes the U.S. dollar stronger, makes the Japanese yen a little bit weaker. But for all these companies that have substantial overseas businesses, what that means is that when they quote on their earnings report, uh, currency revenues, they have to adjust for all these factors because obviously they're invoicing their goods and services in other countries in those domestic currencies. Got to convert that back to U.S. dollars, and that's a big reason why Microsoft needed to provide that update. So certainly worth watching. Yeah, a lesson in FX as well. Uh, <laughs> let's take a look at another stock. Shares of meme stock favorite, GameStop. Moving higher today, up more than 4% after the company reported first quarter earnings. They showed a wider than expected net loss of over $2 a share. The company once again failed to provide an outlook for the rest of the year, but they did follow up its recent NFT wallet unveiling with the announcement of an NFT marketplace now set to launch in Q2. Let's talk about this, Brian. A 10-minute investor call. No questions yet no again. Questions. No guidance yep. for another quarter. No guidance. Um, cash burn a big concern, though. I mean, we, we should point out um, sales did beat expectations. Up 8%. It's up 8%. That's the positive. But again, I feel like I'm a broken record, but where's the future of the company? And it seems like cash burn's a big concern, especially given the investments that need to go into this NFT marketplace. But here's the difference is that cash burn was a bigger concern when the stock was in a point of weakness and there weren't levers that the CFO office could have to try to take advantage of a higher stock price to get into a better capital position, which GameStop and AMC did during the massive run-up in meme stocks. But I want to show you on an intraday basis, obviously it's up 4.9% uh, off of what was essentially a uh, nothing burger in the call because, again, no question questions were asked or answers. But when we took a look at a year-to-date basis, right, this is a stock that's down 14% and actually closely mirrors the action that we've seen in the overall S&P 500. But a lot of volatility through this period of time, especially when you consider that it really wasn't that long ago uh, at the end of March that so we actually saw shares of GameStop go to around $180. So again, if you're one of these bag holders that has been continued to diamond hands uh, on this particular stock, you're probably getting a little bit of a soft stomach over all this action. But but of course, as we've seen on Twitter and on Reddit, all those GME DGENs are still out there, which is probably contributing to a lot of the volatility. Well, in, in uh, you know, one analyst we like to turn to on GameStop, Wedbush's Michael Pachter, also always comes with colorful <laughs> commentary. He's got a $30 price target on this stock, says specifically about the NFT marketplace that this is nonsense. There will be no NFTs for sale, no customers and wallets, and they are, what they're providing will be empty. Yeah. Not the consensus, but... I think there's a lot of skepticism around Still this. Still see the uh, Wall Street Bets army getting involved on that front. But again, as is the story with these meme stocks, it's never really about the fundamentals, is it? It's just about to the moon or not.
How do, we, how do people feel about it? <laughs> Let's shift now to our chart of the day, uh, which of course we're gonna talk about another big company on the move, and that is Chewy. Shares of that pet product retailer jumping after the company reported earnings yesterday. What I'm showing you right now is the net sales for this company, 14% jump over the same quarter in uh, 2021. Expenses apparently not bearing down on the company as Chewy reported positive net income despite analyst expectations for a net loss. And Akiko, very interesting color on the call because they want to look at the churn of adoptions versus what they call a sadly relinquishment of pets mm. in this post-pandemic period. A lot of people adopted pets during the pandemic. And apparently they cited data, I don't know where this comes from, but they cited data 480,000 pets were adopted in the first quarter, but 478,000 were relinquished. Oh. So it's essentially a one-to-one. -one. That is heartbreaking. It's so sad. But I, look, I mean, these companies, it's all about the numbers, right? But well, apparently that's what the churn looks like among pet adoption. Wow. That is a huge turnover. I had wondered about that, right? Because so many people oh, oh. fight over here. Look at these doggos. How can you relinquish? Why don't we just do an hour of this? I mean, this right? is kind of what this we is, need. You, this is killing me right now. <laughs> I can't even remember what we were talking about. Oh, we were talking about Chewy, and you're right. It is about the numbers for the company, but I mean, that's, that's a really fascinating stat because we saw so many people when they were stuck at home adopting pets, and now, you know, those that have returned they to work. They gotta go back to the office. They have to go back to the office. They can't just leave their pets, and so what? They, they just take them back to the shelter? I mean, that. That's... Well, I mean, even for people that need to hold on to their pets, you have to wean them off of the constant attention from being at home. And I wonder if maybe. That's actually a good thing for Chewy because you can buy toys and other types of things that the pets will be occupied for because you're no longer home. You know, Fido's got to play with something. Yeah, but we no know those who still have their pets, pets day. Yeah. shell out a lot of money. Yeah, by the way, no pet owners over here, no actually. pet owners. Yeah, so. Because we're responsible. Yeah, we we're not going to adopt and then relinquish, but... We'll leave that there. I want more I want more dog content on this show. Coming up on the other side of the break, an insider trading bust. Oh, there we go. On a JPEG? Not not these dogs. This maybe this NFT is the one that got stolen. We'll talk about the first ever NFT bust from the Department of Justice. The details next.
allegations of insider trading in the non-fungible token space involving a former employee at OpenSea. That's the largest NFT marketplace. The Department of Justice saying yesterday that it had unearthed the, quote, first ever digital asset insider trading scheme. Joining us with more on the story is Yahoo Finance's David Hollerith. And David, uh, you know, this is kind of sending shockwaves across the crypto world, uh, but specifically the details of this seem very interesting to me because insider trading and fraud can be a little bit of a blurry type of situation and distinction. Uh, what's the big takeaway? What are the details from this uh, particular bust? Yeah, Brian, it's, it's totally blurry. And I think a, the thing to point out is this is a, a significant public case of insider uh, trading in crypto. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to do with the security. And I'll sort of get into that more. But essentially, here's what happened according to the indictment. 31-year-old Nathaniel Chastain, who served as the head of product for OpenSea, which is the largest NFT marketplace by trading volume, was in charge and or part of the selection for figuring out which NFT would be featured on the homepage. Now, as the indictment uh, in states, the OpenSea, OpenSea's information about what would be put on the homepage was confidential, given that the price that buyers were willing to pay after it was after these uh, collections were listed on the homepage tended to rise substantially. Now, between June and September of last year, Chastain allegedly used the knowledge that he had about uh, selection before it happened to purchase approximately 45 NFTs and typically sold them for anywhere between two and five times their initial value that he bought them at. Now, the incident was originally discovered back in the middle of September um, over social media, where Chastain was accused of making doing these activities. And that mainly had to do with um, just random Twitter accounts who had sort of ch uh, traced on the blockchain the transactions that looked like they were linked to his wallet. Now, to clarify, uh, OpenSea, the next day after sort of these allegations started rolling out, quickly changed their or not changed, but let's say revised their employee policies to explicitly make it clear they could not trade on anything that was promoted on the homepage. And Chastain uh, resigned soon after. Now, though, for this charge, he faces a maximum of 40 years in prison between one count of money laundering and another one for a wire fraud. So, David, what are the implications beyond this, when you look at the broader sector, what are the ramifications you're looking out for? Yeah, I mean, it's early to tell where this case goes, but it's definitely going to be one that a lot of uh, lawyers will be following who are part of the space. <laughs> that being said, it's not easy to get a practicing lawyer to weigh in on this case, at least as of yesterday, um, given that, uh, you know, it is is fairly murky, as Brian uh, mentioned. Mm -hmm. Um, but the thing to note here is that um, Chastain's being accused of wire fraud and also money laundering. So um, typically what happens in the crypto sector is that um, it's, it's not an uncommon practice for people to sort of lean on the fact that cryptocurrencies aren't necessarily securities and therefore aren't subject to insider trading laws. So a majority of insider trading laws are sort of uh, managed or governed by the rule 10, 10 B five, which is, you know, um, a part of the securities and exchange act. Um, but, uh, just a thing to note about this is that, uh, okay. it doesn't really involve anything about whether or not it's a, it's a security. The, the whole point basically is that it looks like a security. I mean, it looks like insider trading. And even if it's not a security, um, prosecutors can still go after that. And I, I think that, that that's going to be a wake up call for a lot of investors in the sector. Yeah, still a lot to be determined. I know you'll stay on top of it. David Hollerer, thanks so much for that. Well, coming up, broken promises on Wall Street. Two years after the George Floyd, Floyd protest, we do a pulse check on corporate America's vows to address diversity and inclusion.
Wall Street's promise to embrace diversity, starting from its workforce, has fallen short. That's at least according to a recent New York Times report that found Wells Fargo interviewed so-called diverse candidates for fake jobs, all to comply with diverse requirements. Now, other banks say there are more ways to create more systemic change. Joining us to discuss how to foster workplace diversity, let's bring in Terry Williams, One United Bank president and COO. Um, Terry, it's good to talk to you today. It's certainly timely because, you know, I think when, when the protest first happens, in 2020, we all heard the public promises of diversity and inclusion. We're now two years on. What does that report card look like? Yeah, I'd, I'd say the report card is is mixed. Um, we definitely have institutions that are, as I would call it, doing the right thing. You know that they have invested in our community, um, whether it's in uh, MDIs or minority depository institutions or organizations that really support. Uh, the Black community, the Latino community. Uh, there are definitely corporations that have done that and have formed really what I would call sincere partnerships. Uh, but there are still some that, um, and it's unfortunate to hear uh, that news about the fake hiring, there are some that really um, have some work to do. <laughs> and, um, and then there's some that haven't done anything. So I would say it's really mixed. Hey, Terry, it's Brian here. I mean, what's the solution here? Because what happened at Wells Fargo seems to be not just a bank industry specific thing, but something I imagine a lot of other industries and companies are doing as well, where you're just trying to hit a checkbox on the applicants and not actually onboarding people who would bring on more diverse uh, viewpoints into management decisions within a company. Yeah. How do you make sure that pipeline is more robust as opposed to just checking the box? Yeah. Well, first of all, it definitely starts from the top. Um, leadership really matters. And the leadership really has to really understand that diversity can help your bottom line in addition to being the right thing to do. And if the leadership doesn't believe that, then it will be sort of a check the box kind of scenario. But companies that do believe that, that do recognize you need to have diversity around the table, that it does help to collaborate and, and really make, it helps you make better decisions. Like companies that really believe that actually perform better and that it's not a check your box. They actually are looking for um, the best candidates, but they're looking across a pool that is very diverse. If you don't have that commitment and that understanding at the top, it is going to filter down so that it will be a check the box scenario. And, and that's unfortunate. I mean, Terry, in many ways, it is about really understanding why diversity is important. And sometimes those lessons take a little longer instead of just one conversation, two conversations. We've got those like the NASDAQ, for example, uh, requiring two board directors to, to be, quote unquote, diverse candidates. I mean, do those kind of quotas, requirements, is that necessary, though, to get the ball rolling at least? I absolutely think it's necessary um, because I, I think what happens when you do have those directives uh, is that people pause and really start to say, OK, given this, how do we go about it? And let's start, uh, you know, interviewing, you know, doing outreach to an audience that maybe we haven't been doing in the past. So it definitely helps. Um, but. Again, if it's just to check the box, then you're going to end up having someone who is not really able to not just provide a, you know, sort of the diversity. I, you know, I always say to people, I'm not just like a white person with a black face, you know, that I actually do bring a, an experience to the table that uh, may help you make better decisions. So I, I think it does help to have those directives, but I think in the end, you really do have to understand and believe that diversity uh, can make a difference. And Terry, you mentioned at the top of the interview about the importance of minority depository institutions out there. Uh, you are the largest Black-owned bank in the country. Um, there's not many Black-owned banks. In fact, the amount of Black-owned banks has shrank over time, as is o overall community banks. Uh, what do you right. see as the need for the overall banking industry environment to support more banks like yours that can actually support the communities that really you would have a better pulse on those communities than perhaps the larger GSIBs, for example. Yeah, well, and to put it in perspective, there are about 4,000 banks in the U.S., and only 19 of us are black banks. So um, 
that, you know, just to give you a sense of the, of the size. Um, and we do matter. We do make a difference. There are a lot of programs that we introduce that are really tailored to our community um, that both uh, give banks an idea of things to do, you know, that could be helpful, um, but also hold everyone accountable. It's sort of like if this community bank, Black-owned, you know, largest Black-owned bank, but if we can do it, why can't you? You know, we just introduced a program that is called Cash Please. It's a short-term dollar program to help people that doesn't require a credit check. Our goal is to reduce payday loans um, and to give people options. If we can do that, you know, large banks can do that as well. So it's not only just, you know, what we do for our community, but it's also really, you know, being like a canary in a coal mine or shining some light on some services that really could matter that large banks can duplicate. Terry Williams, president and COO of One United Bank. Thanks so much for taking the time to stop by Yahoo Finance this morning. Appreciate oh, thanks it. Thanks for having me. Let's take a look at markets before we go to break. You can see that the Dow Jones up about three-tenths of a percent. And actually, in fact, all of the major indexes are now in the green. The Nasdaq getting an even nicer bump up 1.4%. Well, coming up in this week's tech support, we'll break down what you need to know about Apple's biggest event of the year. Dan Halley, of course, we will have the details next. Well, Apple's WWDC kicks off next Tuesday. It's expected to bring a slew of changes to the software that powers the tech giant's devices. And of course, the Yahoo Finance's Dan Howley here with the details in this week's tech support. Dan, WWDC Worldwide Developers Conference. Did I nail that? You got it. You okay. got it. You got it. What will those worldwide developers Conference. conference on next week. <laughs> They'll be conferencing about a lot of things. So basically, this is Apple's big showcase for all of their software that they're going to roll out in the next year or so. So uh, the main thing to look at is what's going to happen to the iPhone. That's with iOS 16. Right now we're on iOS 15. We're going to be on iOS 16 come the new iPhone, but we get a preview of what's going to happen when the new iPhone comes out 
in September. So just to give you uh, some basic ideas, we're going to get a new lock screen. Uh, that's part of the, the changes. It's going to be uh, basically uh, allow you to look at items, widgets on the lock screen when your phone is sleeping. So it'll be an always on display. That could be something that really improves uh, the battery life uh, over time, where we could see battery life improvements to power that. Uh, the iPhones now have OLED displays, so if it's all dark and they just use something like a white background uh, for that kind of text that we would see on that lock screen, then that would be uh, easier to use on the battery. So that's going to be something that we could see on the lock screen. Uh, there also could be uh, new changes to uh, the refresh rate on the screen. They could cut the refresh rate. That would uh, end up saving battery life. Uh, and with iPad OS, we could also see some changes with multitasking. So iOS, iPad OS, they're basically the same thing except iPad OS is on iPads. There's some different differences there, especially with that multitasking feature, but we still should be able to get better multitasking with iPad OS. And then uh, we're also gonna get changes to watch OS. Uh, that's going to be a new low power mode, new faces, uh, new health features, things like pill tracking and women's health, uh, and then new workouts. Uh, that's part of the big thing. That's something that I really care about because I use my Apple Watch for working out all the time. So, And if I don't track it, then it doesn't count. And then why did I work <laughs> I'm out? I'm with you. I'm yeah. with you. Yeah. Why did the I work out? I, I didn't track it. outside the office, I just tap it to make sure I'm getting my steps. Yep, in. yep, yep. Um, I realize this is a developer conference, right? So the focus is going to be on the software. But I wonder if we could get hints for potential hardware. And I'm talking specifically about the headset that has been teased out long enough. Could we get potential hints on a timeline for that? There's there's the possibility, right? There's There's been rumors that we could see software from the headset, so that's uh, going to be called Reality OS, uh, if all the reporting is accurate, which I assume it is. Uh, that's gonna allow them to power that headset that's been long rumored. It's supposed to be an AR, VR headset. What we, it, chances are we're not going to see the hardware, but we could maybe possibly see the software. Someone will have to open up the code and like, figure, I feel like every WWDC, that's, that's how what, it goes. Someone that's what they, kinda... they did that with uh, iOS uh, 15. They opened up the code and they saw, they saw it for the App Store actually. Yeah. Uh, and that's how people found out that was the name. But what we could see as far as hardware is new Macs and the new M, uh, M2 chip. So the M1 chip was Apple's own processor that they made. They started slotting it into uh, their laptops, their desktops, their iPads. It's phenomenal, right? The, the battery life on it is absolutely bonkers. It has great power. The M2 is supposed to be an upgrade on that. So hopefully that means even more power, even better battery life. Uh, and this would really stick it to Intel, which basically Apple is just trying to poke them in the eye here and say, you know, we managed to do this. We can keep going with our own processors and provide better products than you guys could with, our, with yours. The eye, they basically drove the knife in. Already. Yeah, yeah. Um, is this the first in-person WWDC? Was it since remote? the pandemic? Yeah, it was remote last there's going to be yeah. there's going to be some in-person uh, aspects to it and some remote aspects to it, but uh, people will be able to stream it online for sure. I feel like you've convinced me to wait to upgrade my laptop. I mean, look, you know, it really the just keyboard is really bad. We complain well, about this they all updated the time. that already. Yes, they yeah, fixed yeah, they yeah, fixed yeah, the yeah, keyboards. I'm still dealing with an old. I mean, laptop. I have one right now with uh, the space bar that doesn't work and my E, C, and R keys have just completely disappeared. And oh, it looks time. like I'm hammered every time I send a message. Yeah, I mean, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's just my I's and my R's are all over the place. But I do think I do think that if we get a, a new piece of hardware outside of computing, uh, you know, or outside of the headset uh, or those processors, it would be a new MacBook Air. So that could be something to really look forward to. And I think a lot of people want that. We will have to see Yahoo Finance's Dan Howley have a safe trip out to San Francisco. Are you leaving tomorrow? Or Saturday. Saturday. Okay. Sunday, well, Sunday, well, then I'll Sunday. wish you a good flight tomorrow then. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Thanks for stopping by. Uh, let's take a look at uh, markets before we say goodbye on this Thursday. You can see again in the green for all the major indexes. Dow up a quarter of a percent. S&P 500 up seven tenths of a percent. And the Nasdaq up 1.3 percent. Before Akika Fujita and I, thanks again for hanging with us for the next hour. We'll see you same time, same place tomorrow right here on Yahoo Finance. Have a good one.